don't, if you don't take okay, the mute everything's off, green then, across the board. You can't hear any audio through the live stream. Oh. Lane, if you're reading. No, I was going to read as long as I could get on. I've had some trouble with connecting oh, okay. in the past. But it should be fine today. So far, so good. Oh, good. So when uh, the clerk is not reading, I just hit the mute on. Uh, well, I, no, I, uh, Valerie, she usually uh, controlled the mute on her side. She muted the mic when she wasn't talking. Oh, she muted it? Okay. Yeah.
Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, this morning's invocation is by none other than our Reverend Javier Maldonado of Seventh Day Adventist. If you will please all rise. Good morning. Before the invocation, I invite you to take a moment of silence with me for the families who have lost loved ones and in the past couple of months. Thank you. The invocation comes from Elder Michael Myers from the Abundant Life Church, Christian Church here in San Marcos. He writes, Gracious God, the creator of heaven and earth, we come before you this morning with our hearts filled with thanksgiving because of the love you've shown and show to each of us daily. God, we thank you for the beautiful day you've created, and we invite your presence into today's meeting. As we travail through uncharted experiences dealing with COVID-19, we ask for your wisdom to face any challenge. I pray today that all egos, personal agendas are set aside in today's meeting and we focus on the good of the community. We lift every agenda item to you today, Father, and we ask for your covering over everyone present today. We pray for all the healthcare workers, first responders, and the families who support these groups. Keep our local, national, and worldwide heroes safe and protected as they look after the health and safety of everyone else. Bless each of our elected officials as they make tough decisions that impact the safety and well-being of us all. We ask these blessings in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Ingleseed? Here. Commissioner Jones? Here. Commissioner Schell? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. And Judge Becerra? Here. And since we do have people uh, dialed in with... Um, with court today, I ask that everyone that speaks, please speak clearly into the microphone so that everyone has an opportunity to hear you. <clears throat> we will start with public comments. Those in the audience who have submitted a public participation witness form will now have three minutes to speak on non-agenda related topics. Unfortunately, no action may be taken by the court during public comments as we are expected not to respond. Any questions will be taken as rhetorical. Please keep all your comments and language civil and respectful or you will forfeit the remainder of your time. In the spirit of respect, please silence your cell phones. First up to speak, Mr. Rodrigo Amaya. Judge, commissioners, um, I'm here today. Last week, information was passed out here to the Hayes County residents. There's a lot of uh, phone calls to my personal phone about the uh, misunderstanding or misrepresentation. Um, I sent them to the county judge's office. They called me back even more upset. Nobody's there. I don't know what's going on. They talk about that they hardly get any time to sleep. They look pretty nice and healthy to me. I don't see any wrinkles. I've had uh, sleepless nights over and over and over, and uh, I didn't look that fresh. I don't know what their secret is, but something needs to be done about that. That office continues to be closed. Citizens call me frustrated that where are the people in charge? I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, uh, we could do a better job of holding folks that are in office accountable. Uh, they took an oath. And we want them to keep up with that oath because we voted for them. Some of us are very, very upset, very, very upset. And I'm just one of many, you know, and we'd appreciate any, any help that y'all could do to make sure that that's addressed. Um, again, 
You know, when talking to folks and guiding them through this chaos crisis, you need to do a better job of keeping it small so that they could understand. You know, there's all kinds of problems going on with the mask. I've been reading all kinds of stuff people shared with me. Um, uh, so just wanted to let y'all know that, you know, there's, the folks in charge of this, they're not doing a good job of uh, being available to the public. They call me. I'm a pretty busy kind of guy, you know. I'm very worried about my hairstylist. She hadn't opened up, so I had to go get somebody else to cut my hair. I've been cutting it for 15 years over here, and I hope she stays there when this is all said and done. So accountability, <coughs> please be available. The office needs to stay open. Figure out a way, something. I don't know. There's a bunch of drones running around. Put it up that you're in your office. If you're not, uh, that way we don't have to waste our time coming up to this courthouse to, you know, because they keep calling me about the offices are closed. They want answers. You know, people went to go get their uh, COVID test at some of the locations that were put on web, uh, on the Facebook and all that stuff. They got there and they didn't know anything about it. So there's a big miscommunication. Last week I talked about how some of these folks that are not qualified to be making decisions that affect us and our lives here in this county are making, are, are in those positions and they, they need to do a better job of making sure that they know what they're doing. Because right now I'm not very uh, impressed by their leadership. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Dan Lyon. Thank you, Judge Becerra. Um, I have the same hairstylist as he does, but this is we haircut by the same one that does Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson's hair, so that's a joke anyway. All right. Thank you, Judge Becerra, for that ab admonition to observe court and court. This is a civil court, even though many times it seems criminal. By now, most of us have received property appraisals from the Hayes is 49 years old. If my central AC worked, I could not use it anyway because it is incompatible with the new Freon. I have informed the CADs of this and countless other problems with the house, but they turn a deaf ear to my pleas. They are either deliberately misappraising the house or they are completely incompetent or both. If I turn to the board of directors, I find that the county tax assessor collector, Ms. O'Kane, is on that board, an obvious conflict of interest. If I appeal to the appraisal review board, I go in front of a bunch of realtors with a vested interest in keeping appraisals high. high. In short, the system is rigged. It is long past time for an investigation into this farce. People in Hayes County are losing houses and land which have been in their family for generations. As the elected officials of Hayes County, you have a responsibility to look out for the best interest of the people instead of the bankers, the businessmen, and the Greater San Marcos Partnership. Let's get to disbursements. We got Service King Collision here, 2016 Ford Explorer repairs for the sheriff. We've got 12 disbursements for $10,254.99. Somebody needs to inform the Sheriff's Department that Hayes County is not their romper room. <laughs> SI Mechanical, check hot water heater for public health. $190 to check the hot water heater. Not to be outdone, the Government Center's water heater was checked by SI Mechanical for $285. That's not doing anything but checking it. Uh, they checked a pressure switch at the government center for 340 bucks. They checked the AC for precinct three commissioner, 255 bucks, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Will you please open agenda item number one? Number one, up, update from the county judge and staff regarding the local disaster declaration and COVID-19. Okay, every week since we've had this declaration, I've been um, grateful that our uh, general counsel has left us on the agenda for us to remind us to tell yet again on another platform <coughs> what's going on. My, my first priority is public health. I made a few notes here I'm gonna read off of. My second priority is getting our businesses back. Uh, I've been working with business leaders, uh, economic development arms, uh, chambers of Commerce leadership and everyone to start to devise the roadmap 
for when and how we start to um, open back up. And uh, it's very important that um, you guys keep in mind that it's not a declaration that we're opening back up tomorrow. It is uh, to let you guys know that I am already working on that. Uh, last week, for example, I worked uh, with Jason Giulietti and asked him to help us devise a roadmap and work with uh, J.R. Gonzalez and the team that has been put together, uh, a task force that we put together for economic uh, support for the small business community. And la since last week, they've been working on ways to help roadmap what a uh, return uh, looks like. And um, some of that is uh, easing of isolation, increasing ever so gently of economic activity and recalibration of essential businesses as it moves along. And of course, with that essential piece is uh, applying more testing and continue precautions. And if as we start to uh, loosen up on our access and open up our business ever so slowly and cautiously, if we don't increase infections in a significant rate, then we can keep going. As I've stated, over 50% of the population will test positive for COVID-19, and that shouldn't alarm folks um, because 20% of that 50% <coughs> are the vulnerable potentially. And so it's important that as our numbers climb, because I know we're just scraping under 100 as of yesterday, and uh, sadly we have our first death in Hayes County as well, and as our numbers continue to increase, just know that in part, this will be because I have been pushing and we have all those that are touching this uh, on test sites and test availability. So these numbers will continue to rise as our availability of tests becomes uh, more, uh, more accessible. But we need more testing. We need lots more testing. Folks are concerned and I agree and we're doing our due diligence. I am, continue to, and have been working on um, Abbott Labs, for example, was uh, talked about often, and they said they were going to have uh, many thousands of tests, and I believe the number I was given was Texas has received 10,000 tests. Yes, you heard me right, 10,000 tests, of which we got 10. Clearly this shortage of testing is not only regional, not only statewide, but national and global. Um, at a federal level, we're having people working on uh, expanding testing as well. Uh, we have our senator pushing on it. Uh, the National Institute of Health is pushing for more testing. Uh, the director of CDC yesterday was on national TV pushing for more testing. Locally, I've been pushing for quite some time now to secure access for the residents of Hayes County. So far, uh, it's, just, it's just reality. I, I've said it this way, I'll, we can't stand on 35 expecting someone to come to help us. We've got to take initiative and we've got to work towards a solution. And so far, um, it's, there's, it's up to us. It's up to us to do this work. I've, a local company has offered to test our population and they've done this before, they've done it in Austin, and I've invited one of their reps here today to introduce themselves. And what I'd like to do is at this moment give uh, Shane the podium to uh, talk about you're one of the, and I have a list whenever you're done, while he's going to the podium, he's one of the folks that are able to test people here in Hayes County. And I wanted to invite him here specifically because, um, well, I'll let him take over. Excellent. And I can't personally test. I'm not a doc. But through our uh, partnership relationships, we can administer tests. So the prayer this morning was that uh, you guys, and I guess all of us collectively, could I ask you to introduce yourself and who you're with? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fair question. So um, I'm Shane Stevens, and I've got numerous companies, uh, Helam Holdings, uh, AnyPlaceMD, Dental Solutions, AnyPlace Audiology, 
we're primarily government contractors, um, some commercial real estate all over the board, been doing business, entrepreneurship since 2003, actually went to Texas State, graduated here in 99 with a degree in long-term health care administration, focused on gerontology. So spent my time here in San Marcos, love this beautiful town, and um, have been in Austin ever since, either overseeing senior care facilities or building businesses. So we're in, um, uh, there's been a lot of media, a lot of talk about a company called MD Box, and I have their biologist here with me. And several, several months ago, almost half a year ago, our company, um, we do, we basically bring innovative solutions to the military. So we're the first company to provide um, handheld digital radiology devices to the military to streamline their SRPs or readiness screenings. So if we've got any military in here, I saw one very militant gentleman walk by earlier. They're familiar with the screenings and readiness program. So we streamline those to make those faster by providing um, handheld digital radiography devices. That was probably 2004. And 2007, we introduced portable dentistry and got that approved to do that for them. 2008, we were the first company to take digital panoramic machines. Those are machines that go around your head. <clears throat> um, we figured out how to take those portable. And so we um, moved on. The latest accomplishments were the first company in the U.S. to receive um, approval in order to do audiology services for the community care network, which was Veterans Choice previously. <laughs> and we just received notification last week. We're the first company in the U.S. to be able to do teleaudiology for uh, TRICARE. So we constantly innovate. We constantly try and use cutting edge technology to um, move and advance things further so that one, we save taxpayers money, two, that we innovate on behalf of our government, and um, three, we, we like the challenge of... One quick second, will you just tell the viewing audience what TRICARE is? Um, TRICARE, that's a, it's essentially a, a insurance program, I guess you could say, for our military that covers their um, medical services either, in, you know, we work in different realms, some for National Guardsmen, reservists, some for active duty, um, and in some cases now it looks like for their family members as well. So kind of across all spectrums, we've been working with the military. So all that to say, um, one solution that we felt we needed to offer to a large government agency was telehealth. And I started interviewing telehealth companies last, probably October, and talked to some of the largest ones in the, the U.S and came very close to contracting with another one from Texas and was absolutely blown away with the technology and capability of MD Box. And met with their team, met with their biologist, Amy, that's here with me. And we selected them as our teaming partner because they have FDA trials currently going to where they'll be able to hopefully have um, flu tests, UTI tests, strep tests, so where basically instead of having to go into a doctor, you can do those from home in time. So it really changes the face of medicine. They're on the cutting edge, just the forefront of what they do. So we selected them as a teaming partner to pursue government contracts. And if you're familiar, you have um, prime relationships, subprime, um, subcontractors, teaming relationships. And out of 100 companies and I don't know, 10 we looked at, four we interviewed, we chose MD Box. And what's happened in the last couple of weeks is um, we were looking at us doing the government side and using them as a white label platform for us. And then they were gonna continue on the civilian side. But through the COVID crisis, we felt it's better for everybody, all of us to work together and try and form a team to where we can provide the best possible solutions to help our country, help our neighbors and in the end, I, I truly deep down believe save lives. So that's me. And um, can you expand a little bit? Because you said MD Box. And uh, 
what has just in a quick snow 30,000 square foot height uh, perspective, can you share what, um, I know that some people have been taking it upon themselves to expand on ideas, but here's our opportunity to present it to the community of uh, what I have done, what you have done, and, and so here we are to share with the community what's before them, and if you can expand on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so um, it's been an interesting month. Uh, the 11th of April was a one-month anniversary of uh, our companies collectively figuring out what other countries have done of how they flatten the curve. And a lot of it's through um, social distancing, but a lot of it's through testing. So there's the PCR test or the nasal swab test that you hear a lot about in the pop-up clinics. There's also the serology test, the antibody test. And that one, um, it's kind of been a sticky subject here in the US. It hasn't been politically popular. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of fear. You know, I've watched as we've gone through this and had conversations with large companies. You know, I've watched their CEOs that are generally fearless, bold leaders just crumple into a corner and shiver because they're, they're paralyzed and they can't, they can't make a decision on what to do. Um, I've watched politicians do the same thing. Instead of doing what's right, they're, um, they're just lashing out at one another. And that's what we do a lot of times when we're afraid or when there's, um, there's fear. But what I, I saw with the judge is he was the very first person to connect with us on looking at how to provide a solution. You know, how can we jump out and do something to help residents of Hayes County? And I'm unbiased, I'm agnostic. I love the Hayes County concept just because I went to, to school here and um, just feels good even being back here. But we're looking at all the other counties and I don't think anyone in the US has the volume of tests that we have. We are the first company to get la the lateral flow serology test through. I can show them to you guys. I've got a couple of different samples <laughs> if you wanna see them. But we're the first ones to get these through um, customs and FDA several weeks ago. And Amy's one of the finest molecular biologists in the nation. She validated all of these tests. I think there's four or five manufacturers that we validated them. So she can speak to that. Um, she's the clinician, obviously, that knows that area. But we've got another 250,000 that shipped out, they're supposed to ship out yesterday. And we've got another 1.25 million that are coming in. And if you look at these countries that have been successful in doing this, they're testing at least 20% of the population. So we've got, anybody know the population in Texas? 27 million? Something? 27 million? 27. Okay, perfect. And then in the U.S., we're at 360 million. So if you look at um, just Texas, 20%, that's going to be 5.4 million tests. If we're going to apply the Singapore model, y'all look it up, research it. It's all there. It's available. You can learn about it. Or I can help educate you guys. That's the biggest problem of these attacks that are coming from different folks, high levels of government, uh, mid-levels, city levels. It's just ignorance. People are not aware, and not ignorance in a bad way. It's just this is new. <clears throat> so I can help. I'll get on phone calls. I'll do teleconferences. Um, we'll bring in our doctor. Um, we'll bring in the biologist. We can educate people on exactly what's going on, how to fix this, but research. Taiwan, research Singapore, research Germany, see why they've had lower infection rates, see why they've had lower death rates. A lot of it has to do with the testing. Um, and a lot of it is the antibody testing. Those are folks who have fought the disease, have overcome the disease, and they can now go back to work. So there's some other concepts that are, I definitely don't want to get us too far down the road of future thinking and innovation because we just got to get over this first little hump first. But um, if we were to apply that same concept, 20% of 27,000 is 5.4 million. I know you, you say mentioned that again. Do what? Say that number again. 20% of, of 27,000 is 27 how million? million. Okay. <laughs> 20, I just want to clarify. That's a <laughs> yeah, I know words and all that are really important. Words mean. So please make sure that if I say something that's off base, 
that I get the opportunity to clarify because I haven't had that opportunity on some of the other things that we've been doing. So I really appreciate that. Next, sir. My question is, um, these are the people that I um, managed. I'm talking to people at nonstop on every level, on every front, trying to secure uh, what we need for Hayes County. And so MD Box, as you've heard, is um, they, they've been willing to help us uh, by committing testing for Hayes County because I was one of the first ones there knocking on their door. And I wanted to bring this to you guys so that you could maybe dispel some myths or uh, any hit pieces that are out there about them. Uh, here's an opportunity for us all to talk about it and ask them any questions <coughs> that could uh, shed some fair light on the company. I, I do have a lot of questions. I'll, I'll be honest with you, and these may be um, your colleague might be better to, suited to uh, answer them. I'm not sure. Which one, Doctor Legier? Uh, the, if you if you are specifically not with MRG or with MD Box, then you're not. Well, but we are doing a collective effort, joint venture, and I can Perfect. try to speak on their behalf um, as much as possible. Um, uh, no, that's great. I, and the reason I ask that is because I, uh, I do have a lot of questions, and more specifically, I have questions over some of the statements, the very public statements over the last couple of weeks about availability of testing, effectiveness of testing, and those kind of things to our citizens here in Hayes County. Right. Um, what the company knew, what our county knew, and uh, what was released publicly, because I don't believe that those things jive very well, and I have a concern over that. Um, I saw the reports, I, I watched the press conference where it was said point blank, these tests, we will provide tests to Hayes County. They'll be available to the public. Um, the, uh, the county is in an agreement with, uh, to roll out a, a task force, which we are a part of. Um, can you speak to those issues as to, because the clarification from Dr. Legier was, we never said that we are a testing company. We've said that we are a patient monitoring company. Is that correct? I can't say exactly what he said. I watched a little blurb of the um, press conference in regards to a large retailer and what was said as far as um, where the, the test would be available. <clears throat> so I, I saw that part of it. That's about the extent of what I watched. Um, what I can tell you is I know that there were some things that uh, were either misstated or, or taken out of context or got a little bit too far ahead. And, um, you know, frankly, some mistakes in that regard were made in trying to find solutions and move quickly. Um, I can tell you the team at MD Box, I've got to know a lot of the people there. They're good people. Um, my team, our military team, they're good people. A lot of us have been working from four or five in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Not a lot of sleep. Trying to figure out a solution of how to pull together and help people. So um, on that, if they've you know, made missteps in trying to jump out and help, it's not intentional to mislead the public. And if I know one of the pieces was the, the whole in-home testing. That's a big, hot topic. And you know, I think with that, I could show the, the concept because under the emergency authorization, perhaps under the Stafford Act, there's the allowance for EUAs, emergency use authorization. And the president pushed that down to the states. To my understanding, our governor pushed that out to the FEMA directors and the counties. And to my understanding, the judge, it's the FEMA director, theoretically, they can do EUAs. Now, I will say, the judge, very forward thinking, um, amazing insight, because it was probably two weeks after you did that, that the governor of New York, Governor Cuomo, was saying, we have got to get in-home testing. So I think as a precautionary measure, it's not a bad idea to get to where that could be something, but we're not doing that right now. We're not offering in-home testing. We are offering telehealth drive-through testing and it's the most socially distant model that can be done. It keeps the frontline providers, if you look at the number of medical providers, 
um, frontline responders, police officers that are, that are infected, and they're passing it back and forth, this model helps with that. So I do, I, I do want to follow up on the statement that you made there. More specifically, um, the uh, emergency use authorization. The FDA is who actually authorizes emergency use authorizations, and they're who um, initially your company had to reach out to to say, we're bringing these tests in. Um, you had to send them a notification, and with that notification on usage. Um, that notification, uh, because I've been able to actually see some of the emails uh, responding to your company from the FDA, uh, initially was, okay, we're, we're going to look at this authorization, and you all can bring these in and distribute them. Um, FDA further looked at that authorization, or the, the, the request that you put in, and actually said, no, wait a minute. Your claim for use of in-home tests, you may not use these for in-home testing unless you actually do uh, an additional study and additional testing and you submit that for clearance through, you, through FDA. Is that correct? That very well may be true. I have not seen that email, but I do know after the EUA was submitted from judge down here, legal team looked at it and decided. Through, the, the judge submitted an EUA? It was a written out EUA. It was uh, Judge, have you submitted an emergency use authorization for any of these products? Let's finish what he's doing. No, I, I'm asking. He just stated that you did. Did you let's, submit one? Let's finish what they're discussing, and then I'll, add, I'll answer all your questions when we're done. Yeah, so, and it may be a wording deal, but it's, you know, written out as far as, you know, allowance to provide the testing down here in, in San Marcos. Um, I don't know if the FDA has said, yeah or nay, but I know that the FDA has not allowed yet for in-home testing. You see from so, the so White my, House. My question would, would be, because I, I made the same statement two weeks ago in, in our court, that the FDA has completely disallowed any type of in-home testing at this point. <coughs> so my question is why, even after that, did representatives <coughs> from your company or the companies that you represent here today specifically say that they were providing a solution to our residents for in-home testing? They shouldn't have been. They and did. they didn't, to my knowledge. Um, we can read some statements from the CEO that said Yeah, that. I would, I'd love to see that. Uh, because and the I'm fact happy to talk to you. Is, like, I, have, I have serious concerns, and, and I've got a number of questions here. This company has marketed to our neighbors. I've got emails from counties surrounding us where point blank it says, and, and I'll read these, more than happy to. Um, to whom it may concern, and this is from the uh, executive, account executive for business development for MRG Health and MRG Medical. Our team of doctors behind MRG Health and several elected officials throughout Texas, including mayors, judges, county commissioners, have come together to provide a turnkey screening and in-home monitoring program for COVID-19. We are the FEMA designated COVID response team for Hayes County and will soon likely be for Harris, Bear, Uvalde, Williamson, and Travis counties. Do y'all currently have a relationship or a contractual relationship with either our county or any of those counties? Um, I do not. And MRG Medical, I don't have agreements with those guys. Um, I've met a gentleman named Kyle in person in the last couple of weeks. It was at that press conference referring to is the first time that I've met him. And um, but what, what we're considering here, what was at our place when we sat down is a contract with MRG, with MRG Medical. And so is this what you're speaking to today? No, he's got about that. No. All right, so let's, let's continue to talk about testing then because in this, it specifically says that they are going to come to together to provide turnkey screening and in-home monitoring for COVID-19, including testing. Um, there's actually a COVID task force, COVID-19 task force emergency budget item for Hayes County, which was which were distributed to municipalities which surround us. Um, that uh, lists a price list for the in-home monitoring, and uh, which which we're discussing today, um, for the actual test kits, what the charge would be, and so. Uh, 
it, it seems to be somewhat convoluted what we're talking about today that this is mixed up with perhaps what your company and your company's you know messaging was before and is today it's still kind of unclear if you are offering the testing um, and you are doing this through the relationship with either MRG or um, MD Box or for that matter Reliant Immune Diagnostics all three of those companies have been involved in these uh, in this back and forth with the FDA relative to whether or not their tests could be used in home and uh, they made very clear statements even after they received notification from FDA that they could not do this in home that they were going to yeah. and so I, I you can forgive my my I don't want to say my I have a real problem or I have a real issue trying to trust the statements that you're making today as to okay this is what we do and this is how we're going about it and and it's not a personal attack against you but I have documentation here that specifically disputes the claims that the, that these uh, that this company has made in the past and so I I, I I have a real issue with trying to if you're saying we can provide this and this is the best way to go about it, I have issue with that. Yeah. And so I would love to, to hear some clarification. All right. So MRG does not represent me, my company, in any way, shape, or form. And I did see the uh, site that was put up, and it said that it would offer in-home monitoring. I think that's the phrase that has been confused and turned um, and I, you know, they, they took that site down to the best of my knowledge. Okay, here, but, here's the letter directly from their CEO talking about in-home testing. Actually, yeah, what was the date of that? Um, it was, let me look here. While he's looking, that's, I'm glad you're bringing that up because in-home testing is nothing that I was in communication supporting in any way. And in your... And the first time you and I saw each other was that day that you described with that video. And I remember clearly saying, this is not in-home testing. And I think people have made that uh, leap erroneously. And that's why I, I said, I can't. And here's why he's here. I said, I can't defend this company. It's not my company. And I can't keep looking like I'm their representative. So I said, let me ask you to come and you explain it because there's been a distraction with in-home monitoring of your vitals through telemedicine and an in-home test. Uh, so but the difference is important to, uh, to highlight, so I'm glad you're, you're expanding on that. that. That's a good point. So let's talk about that. When, when this process or, or when that was put forth on, in that press conference, um, it was stated in the press conference that there would be in-home testing. Uh, it was very clearly stated. It was very clearly stated that these these would be available for the public purchase uh, and through some very specific retailers that were mentioned. Um, all those things were mentioned. Uh, to the clarification point that Dr. Legere made in, a, in an interview with KVU, you may have seen, he said, you know, I think there's been some confusion. We are in-home monitoring, uh, a uh, in-home monitoring solution for all patients. Right. Uh, it, that's, that is... That's your understanding as well. I guess my question would be, I mean, here's an email. Uh, Judge, this is actually was an email that you received um, from a doctor who is a doctor with MD Box, who says, uh, and this is actually prior, the Sunday prior to the press conference. Um, he says, I don't know what or who all is part of this COVID task force, so perhaps there are other aspects of this I'm unaware of. But speaking from the MD Box perspective, I am very concerned about saying anything in-home testing. My understanding is that these tests are clinical use only. They are not cleared for in-home use. And I believe that this would be a major red flag to the FDA. Amy, can you give me more details on how we are proposing to use these tests and what we can and cannot say? In terms of MD Box specifically, a couple of comments. To the point that you just made that this was an in-home monitor, that MD Box is actually an in-home monitoring solution, health solution. The patient monitoring <clears throat> feature that we talk, that we discuss will not be live until Wednesday. So in other words, when this was rolled out, if it was only a patient monitoring 
system. That patient monitoring system wasn't even live to the public or would not be live to the public until Wednesday. And MD Box is currently a cash only pay for end users. So anyone that, that logged on or that used this service would have to pay cash out of pocket. Is that correct? The, um, the remote monitoring would be free. As far as the symptoms, the daily symptom tracker, that's being rolled out for free. It's, so I, I guess my other question is then, um, if it, and this is just, again, an email directly from MD Box. Uh, so the monitoring service that, that y'all claim as the solution wasn't even available when this press conference was held. Is that correct? And, and, <laughs> and to be fair, what uh, Commissioner Smith has done is he has uh, submitted a public information request of my email. So he's reading off of rough draft work and back and forth conversations and articulation of uh, messaging to make sure it's consistent throughout because I saw some of these emails come through and so he's referencing some of that and so he read one that actually pointed out that make sure that you guys don't say in-home testing so that's great that you read that one because nobody as you started with nobody that I've met has tried to misguide or misdirect and quite the contrary and I'm glad you're here because I feel bad trying to defend you guys, but really, I, that's not my job. I shouldn't do that. That's your job. And no, so, I appreciate and that so I'm glad you're here. But like I see let me I let me finish. just expand a little further. Yeah. And so I'm glad you're here because although Commissioner Smith did do a, a scrape of all our emails, um, those are a lot of conversations that are brainstorming. And so, to read them in court, it's important that folks understand that those are snippets of conversations to clarify and to synchronize your messaging. Half of those things, I don't know why I was copied. Some of those I didn't even open. Nevertheless, as soon as they go to my email, they're public record. But, but most importantly, all I ever heard, which I'm grateful to clarify, is your company is willing to monitor through self-monitoring through the app for free everyone in our population that is interested, it's not being mandated, that is interested in participating, you guys are willing to do all of that for free and I thank you for that first. Second, you guys said if the time comes that they need or want telemedicine, the first choice you guys were gonna offer them is to go to a local provider. Good job because I believe in supporting local, although you guys are Austin Hayes County still, go to a local provider. And then the second level was go to a local telehealth provider. And if the third, and if that didn't work, your third option was going to be, as is going to be, um, we can set up a televisit with you to get a medical professional to further uh, talk to you about symptoms that may have gotten like a fever. Once you reach a certain threshold, whatever your algorithms are, I don't pretend to know what you guys have set up exactly. And once these numbers set up to trigger uh, a medical visit, then you guys would if you took that medical uh, charge, if you were chosen among the options, that at that point in time, someone wanting medical attention at that time would need to pay for it. That's fair. I thought that was fair. And if the medical professional was to determine that they fit the symptoms and, and they had the need for a test, at that point in time, then your medical professional team would prescribe a test and then they would get that test. But it was never an in-home test, it was in-home monitoring of the individual. That's how I've always understood it. Judge, I, I would just ask for one point of clarification sure. there because um, in practice, in the press conference that you participated in, that's exactly not what was said. Well, in that, no, no well, in, in that press conference, it was very <coughs> clear that it was stated, and you, you said this it. earlier. I saw it, yeah you saw this press conference that these would be available for the general public's purchase for in-home use. The first submission that y'all made, to, that this company made to the FDA for these tests said, these will be used for, distributed for in-home use. At which point the FDA responded and said, no, they, you cannot do that without additional testing. File a formal emergency use authorization. Right, and we're, we're and still in, we're still in ongoing communication with the FDA. That, and it's, have you filed an emergency use authorization so for them? 
do you, with the FDA? Do you actually want to learn what's happening, or do you want to keep interrupting me and attacking? Because I can tell you, I've been involved in a lot of. Um, I'm asking over specifically the years. about this. Yeah, you've asked several questions, and you you, you keep um, interrupting me when I try to answer. So. Let me step back just a little bit, and I'll explain a couple of things. One, um, I had no clue what side of the aisle Judge Becerra was on. Who cares? A couple of weeks. Would you stop interrupting, please? And so we've tried to work together to figure out a solution to do testing here in Hayes County. And um, I'm involved in quite a few circles supporting, helping conservative causes. I've done it for a long time. These attacks, I thought were coming just typical. I've been on that side of it. I thought I was like, oh my gosh. And now I realize it's the same conservative party. We, I'm starting to get concerned by my inability to answer this that it's not just about what's right for Hayes County. We said in the prayer this morning, let's do what's right for Hayes County. But I don't think you, anyone for your teams reached out to MD Box and asked for them like man to man, hey, what's going on guys? What are y'all trying to do? Now I'm here from the sidelines getting in after the whole press, press conference happened. I already said, I'm not involved with this MRG company. I have no <coughs> contracts, no direct business relationship, nothing with them. I'm trying to explain it to you, but I can't get a word out edgewise. So I'm, I'm a little perplexed. Do you guys, I've so got, I've got 50,000 tests we bought. I've got 30,000 remaining. I'm holding 2,000 for Hayes County. I can show them to you. I'll open up our warehouse. I'll show you all of them. I'll show you the picture I got of the 250,000 that are coming in. But there's a limited amount of time I'm willing to spend running around in circles with you on this whole deal. If you want the testing for your residents, I'm happy to provide it. We are going to do it at $79. Um, that's probably, we might make a little bit. We lost money on our first Austin event. I've spent as much as I can personally on buying these tests because I know they save lives. So I'm here to try and help, and I'm here to answer questions if you want to hear them. But if you don't, that's fine. We'll do our testing in other counties, and we'll move on. Let's ask specifically about the test. Let's ask specifically about the test. Do you have or have you filed with the FDA an emergency use authorization? I'm Amy Altman. I have a Ph.D. from Vanderbilt University in Molecular Biology. I'm in charge of our clinical and regulatory affairs. We are in the process of doing the clinical studies. I don't know if you know much about the FDA or what it takes to submit an application. There's a number of analytical validation and clinical validation studies that have to be done. And so when we received communication back from the FDA about submitting the EUA, we endeavored to start on those clinical studies. And in the interim, we're providing testing through our practice. So we have medical providers administering these tests to people that pass a certain criteria that qualify for testing. That's what we did in our first pop-up testing in Austin. We had people screened if they were, um, if they were in the category that was um, to get a test. We had them in a certain time frame so that we could space everybody out. They came in, windows were rolled up the whole time. The only time they opened was for the medical provider to prick their finger and do the test, and then they were followed up with a telemedicine visit from our providers. So we are currently in the process of doing those clinical validation studies. They're not done in one day. We have to find positive patients. So we have partnered with Cedar sinai in California as they unfortunately have a lot more patients that are positive than we do. And so we're doing those clinical studies now for resubmission to the FDA. So I'm going to ask my question again. Have you submitted an EUA as directed by the FDA for this? We can't submit the EUA until we have the clinical validation studies. Thank you. Thank you. And so let me expand on that just a little bit. I have some notes somewhere, but the manufacturer that you guys are using is on the FDA approved list. Am I right? Yes. The FDA has decided for serology tests that they are not processing emergency use author. They're not mandating emergency use authorizations. They have decided to not um, interfere with the distribution of serology tests from companies that have submitted validation data and are on their list of notified manufacturers, which our manufacturers are. To your, co to your colleague's point, words matter, Judge. What did, did you just say that, these, that this test was on the approved list? And you I did not say That's that. What he, he I'm said. gonna clarify, you, clarify you really gotta let me finish. Um, I have said 
that this test that they are using and offering to Hayes County residents is, uh, the manufacturer is on the FDA approved list. Yes, I did. And yes, it is. So the test, the way I've been told and the way I've looked, I'm doubting Thomas. So I go and I go, I actually do the work and I go to the FDA website and I looked up the name of the manufacturer that you guys told me you're using. And I found that manufacturer as an approved FDA manufacturer for these tests. And so that built comfort for me. And then the other part was that I've learned is the molecular tests, if I correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not going to try to cram 16 years of medical school or your level of profession in a few crash courses and reading headlines, but the molecular tests are the ones that require the EUA, emergency use authorization, and the serology do not. That's correct. So the question is loaded, in my opinion. Oh, in addition, is... sir, please stop interrupting. In addition, um, the most important part of this is and we've heard it again and again, performed by a medical professional. Right. As I've seen it, do you have an opportunity to see where Dr. Legere's credentials are? Because I don't have them handy, but I consider Dr. Legere uh, a, an exceptional uh, reference. And as far as different MDs go, the more you know, the more you're uh, an expert, and so I've not heard someone with even similar credentials as Dr. Legere uh, dispute his direction. And so in many settings, I have asked for a clarification. I've asked in many phone conference calls, hey, I am moving forward with this effort unless someone gives me a better roadmap because to do nothing is not acceptable for me. And so I had this idea that Dr. Legere and the whole medical team does satisfy the need that the FDA is uh, endorsing, which is testing with medical oversight. And so we're getting hung, hung up on emergency use <coughs> authorization, which let's be honest, you should never be applying for one because you're not a molecular test. Did I misspeak on any of it? No, that's true. Currently, the only tests that have uh, received emergency youth authorization have been nucleic acid tests, except for one serology test that just got approved, but it is only approved for use with a venous blood draw, Correct. not a finger prick, so it's not amenable, amenable to a pop-up testing um, type of situation. And so, and so just to clarify, do you know of any uh, tests here in Hayes County or in Travis County or in Williamson County that are FDA approved for this COVID-19? No. Of any? No? no? Serology tests, no. No? Or? No, there's actually one, as she just mentioned, one serology test. Your question was, do you know of any test approved that are in that we're Travis using, County? Or Hayes County or Hayes that we're County. using. And there are a number of molecular tests. Is that there not There are correct? a number of molecular tests. There are no... I don't even know the availability of the CELEX test, which is a serology test that recently got an Correct. EUA. But again, um, the limitation of that test is it's not approved for finger stick whole blood. It is only through venous draw serum or plasma. And I had a couple of mayors, just to answer that a little further, I had a couple of mayors in my call yesterday because every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I get all elected officials to uh, update on what we're doing. And I had a couple of mayors ask about that company, and I asked them to help because we're, we're all limited, we all have 24 hours, and so they were, they were pushing for more options, and I said, great idea, will you help? Will you call and see what you can come up with? And the response was that they got a generic answer of, there's a huge demand, and there's no testing available. Right. Um, and so that won't work, because currently we have tested less than 1% of our population, and me flying this airplane that no one else has ever flown before, Anywhere in our region, in our state, or in our country, you can bash the people at the driver's seat all you want, from Trump to Abbott to me. We can be bashed all you want. But the truth is, nobody has seen the instrument cluster before. And what I need is to get beyond the less than 1% that we, have, that we have tested. And this is just one of those options available. You have said in numerous conference calls, uh, as a MD box, you have said, and have offered to say this test is not to be taken as an exclusive 
It is to be taken in conjunction with. It is not a replacement of. It is a tool in the toolbox. You guys have been, in my mind, as uh, the guy flying this airplane, you guys have been above and beyond. And so that's why I'm glad you're here because some of these things, the way they're being framed, it's just, I believe it's inaccurate, just to be polite. It's just inaccurate efforts. And I may not tell the best story, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. And I think that's important. So. I appreciate that. And I'd like to also mention that as a company, we're technology agnostic. We don't care who manufactures the test. We have them coming in from five, six different manufacturers. We're trying to fulfill a testing need in Texas to protect our citizens. So as long as the tests come in, we validate them. We're not making the tests. We're using manufacturer's tests, and we're agnostic to which ones we use. Our main goal is to have the tools in the toolbox to help diagnose or treat or tell our um, citizens when to isolate, when um, they need to stay in for 14 days. So we're just... We don't, I don't want to say we don't care what tools in the toolbox. We're open to all the tools in the toolbox. And we're actually looking now, can we get access to some of the nucleic acid tests that we can use to supplement our serology testing? So we're just looking to provide a solution. And while you're there, before you get off the podium, are there any questions from other commissioners? Because I know that we've been a little lopsided with Commissioner Smith and myself talking the whole time. Not sure what we're posted to talk about right now. Well, we're just um, giving an update on testing and what's what going on. And I'm ready, to, like we're doing I'm, ready to, yeah. I'm ready to move on, and I just want to give you guys a chance to ask them any questions while they're there. I'm not ready to move on yet, so. Yeah. But Commissioner uh, Ingles, Amy, please? you said you were with MD Box. Is yeah. that who you yeah. are Yeah, MD Box is actually the product name. The company is Reliant Immune Diagnostics. And as far as the update, I've got a question. Who is actually on this Hayes County COVID task force? Task force? So we're not associated with that website. Um, I think MRG set that. But does anybody website? know who that is? I've never. Y'all are listed as a member of it, and Dr. Legier participated in the rollout con press conference. So I would ask, what, what role do y'all have in this COVID task force if you participate? So in I have conference? no role, and we actually asked um, that that website be taken down because of the information that on it was um, being misconstrued. Was what? I'm sorry. Misconstrued. Misconstrued. I'm sorry. Was there was a confusion about the in-home monitoring being so, in-home testing. So, so did y'all have a? Did y'all? So did y'all have a contract with HEB? We do not have a contract. But in the press release, it said y'all did. Excuse me. In the press release, it said y'all did. We do not, to my knowledge, and I'm the CEO of the company, have any live contracts that have been executed. But did the press release say y'all did? I was not part of that press release. So did, it, did you see I, it? She I, doesn't I, know. I saw several it, versions of it. I don't know which one actually went out. Um, but to my knowledge, we do not have any contractual relationships. Okay. And then I do, I mean, so this is an update. Who is on this task force? Do you know? Are you on it? Uh, they offered to put my name on it. I said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. So nobody. So, so well, we what, you're, what you're witnessing is an effort to put together a solution for Hayes County. And so I think it might be uh, clear to say that what they have done is uh, provide access to testing. And in the process, some of the communication has been uh, misunderstood. For example, uh, what was that word used earlier? In-home monitoring versus in-home testing. And so I think that's, that was a good call on your part to say, you know what, that's being uh, taken out of context, that's being misconstrued, let's not use that. So that's a good job on your part. Any other questions for them? I, well, not for them, but I do have some questions about the, where we're on the deck. Well, so I'll, you can come back later. Okay, yes. Commissioner Shell, any questions for yes, you? Sir. Thank you. I, I, I still continue to have questions more specifically on, uh, on the, the items that were shared with our neighbors. And I say that our, you know, there know were pitch right packets to. and marketing materials given to other municipalities, other counties out there, specifically referencing MD Box to provide service for them. And uh, those services in those pitch packets, it actually outlines an emergency budget item for Hayes County and lists a price list for us to do business with them. Um, this is a, as an example of what these other counties could use. And it actually outlines a, uh, it states that, uh, that in this partnership that uh, MRG is the FEMA designated COVID response team for Hayes County. 
Again, I can't um, speak and for I know MRG. You can't. I, don't, I, I appreciate that. It seems I like someone ask, got ambitious is what it seems like. I, I would ask that, uh, actually, Mr. Villalobos, could you, you might be able to clarify a couple of these things. So thank you for that, and I appreciate <clears> it. <throat> and I appreciate you guys coming over here and uh, shedding some light on what you guys are doing and what you guys have uh, offered. I think it's wholesome, and I think it's wonderful, and I believe that some of these pieces have been put out uh, maybe prematurely or uh, by mistake, but they were nothing to do with you guys. And I think that's also good to point out. You had nothing to do with it. Um, so that's good. That's good. Thank you guys very much. Mr. Villalobos. And let me just clarify. If that's the case, I, I do apologize because this is, this is not... I would love to call you. I don't, I've never met you until today. The, the fact of the matter is, is the information has been placed in the public domain and the information that we've been able to garner through the own emails here in the county paint a very different picture than what you're trying to share with us today. And I appreciate your professionalism. I do appreciate you coming up here. It's never easy to, to, to come up and, and answer questions for, that were not raised by you and uh, we're not put into the public domain by you, but you were responsible on behalf of your company to answer them, and I appreciate that. Um, I would encourage that y'all get some additional clarification out there. Um, and to, to finish up, and thank you very much for your time, to, to get some additional clarification specifically on these, this, and, and thank you. I have one question for Mr. Villalobos. Um, were you... Villalobos, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Villalobos. I, I, um, I just want to clarify one thing. Whenever you, uh, two weeks ago, when we discussed this to try to avoid clear, you know, some of these concerns, I asked you specifically if you knew anything about this press conference, and uh, you told me no that Monday night when I called you. You said no, and the next day in court I, I specifically asked, did you know anything about this? And you were very clear that you had a thousand other things on your plate and you didn't know anything about this press conference. And I, I actually thanked you for being honest and and up front about that. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Um, so it came as kind of a shock to me whenever I did get these emails and you um, not only were on the emails, but you edited some of the materials that were put out, specifically the press release for this COVID task force uh, that were released at that press conference. Some of the things that uh, were provided to me in the emails were to provide uh, um, support for editing but none of the times or when this was supposed to take place was ever provided to me that I, that I recall. And uh, even to the point where that press conference was taking place, I told you the truth, I didn't know that was taking place at the time. I didn't know that was a press conference and I didn't know that was to be true. And, and uh, there have been sorry. some documents that were provided to me and, uh, as the request of the judge to uh, my, my take, my, my interest, my, my understanding, and there were several times that I did do some editing on it, and I sent it right back to the judge, and that was it. And outside of logistically creating a press conference or any other action outside of that, um, I remained uh, outside of that, that realm. And quite frankly, uh, a lot of the stuff that was going on largely was kept from me uh, because I was busy doing other things, but I think that was something that the, the judge was, I believe at this point, and with conversation here, he was organizing. And, and it was outside of my realm of me organizing it. So I felt. So I guess the, the one other question, the, um, the claim that, well, the claim that this company was or is the, uh, the FEMA designated resource for our county and under contract with our county. Did you know anything about that? I knew that there was some wording that was in regards to those particular facts and I think that I, my, my, my point was to speak with the judge and tell him, you have to make sure that this is correct because I'm not sure of that, of that, of that because I haven't done any research on it. These were just pieces of information that were flashed to me via an email or maybe discussed but None that I was ever really able to do a whole lot of research on until I actually found the name of a manufacturer. And if you looked at my emails, what I did was I asked, and I went, oh, look, I'm not going to ask third, fourth party or tertiary people. I'm just going to send an email to the FDA and see what they have to say. 
So I did that and they, they responded. And, and if you, I know you took some of my emails as well, the entire office, and you saw a response from the FDA and it specifically refers to section four of, of the FDA and it shows a list of that particular manufacturer listed under there for, um, uh, I don't remember the, net, the specific wording for it. And as soon as I found that, I said, look, Judge, this is, this is what's listed on here, but that's all I know. And I don't, the other research was just as much as anybody else is doing is to make sure that if I'm gonna be engaged in anything, this, that, that it has to be legitimately following the processes. And, that, and that's, that's what I've tried to do. And I've consulted to him as such. So this, uh, back to this pitch packet that I just mentioned a moment ago, um, some of our regional partners actually asked the, the COG, CAPCOG, are these guys legitimate? What do you know about, about this? And uh, specific to, are they the designated COVID team for Hayes County? As they, were, as they were pitching these other counties, and being the regional partners they are, um, those counties reached out directly to CAPCOG. And uh, CAPCOG, knowing nothing about this group or this company, reached out to you. And what was your response to CAPCOG? I don't remember to CAPCOG, and, and that would have been, you said Mr. Ritchie reached out yes. to me? I don't remember what my response was there. He actually emailed you uh, the pitch packet that was given to other counties and asked you, are these guys legit? And your response was, yes, they are. We reside, they reside in Austin. In that email, it included all the documents relative to the COVID task force that I mentioned, the uh, costs for, uh, for telemedicine visits um, that the counties would be charged, um, the dollar figure that uh, they would be charged to do overall assessments of those counties. Um, there's actually even a letter in there on, that Judge Becerra has given MRG and, and MD Box, evidently. Um, actually a letter that, it, did we ask for assistance from CBP for Customs and Border Protection for personal uh, protection equipment? No. I. I as the emergency manager, you don't know anything about a request? Well, here's a, here's a letter from Judge Becerra to Customs and Border Protection saying that this letter is to expe express our immediate need of supplies and related diagnostic testing uh, and, and protective masks for community health systems. Over the past several weeks, MRG Medical and MD Box have been advising Hayes County and surrounding cities on solutions to serve our constituents with regard to COVID-19. If there is anything that can be done to expedite these masks and other supplies, um, it would be of great assistance. This was provided to the company and they used this in their marketing materials to express the relationship that they had with Hayes County. And that's not fair to ask Alex of because that's my work. Just to be honest, for example, I've I, the reason Alex. I asked it about it is because this is from his email where he received it. And okay. I'm just asking as the emergency management coordinator if he knew about it. So if the material is, is, if the people are real, if you could see them sitting here and they're doing these things and they're offering tests and they are tangible tests available, again, I believe the framing of the question seems a little bit, um, I don't know, shifted. But the idea that the company is here doing these things, offering these things, is legit. They really are offering to us. We really did uh, secure access to the residents of Hayes County for much needed testing. And so are they legit? Do they really have these tests? Yes, they are. Yes, they do. And so I just believe that that's a little bit of a, of a reach to try to put, uh, pin that on Alex because I- I'm, I'm I, not I, I pinning just, that on Alex. I'm asking Alex, I just don't he aware because he, no, I, I, you think, said I think these, the are, question... these are legit and here's the, the, I'm asking, did you know about it? And then one more piece I want to add uh, is Why that fact that you're, judge? that's okay. That's that pack that was uh, conveyed, I've never even seen it either, just to be honest with you. That's why I've said that those uh, efforts are ambitious. Those efforts were, uh, I consider, overreaching. And um, frankly, I'm, I'm disappointed that it was done because that was not the intent. What was Nevertheless. The, what, was, what was the intent of the, of the letter that you provided them? The intent of the letter was to bring as I've always stated, the intent of the letter was to bring much needed supplies to Hayes County. 
and it continues to be the same. And once this is over, we'll have all the stories to tell. And so to that end, I am gonna to continue to work to bring much needed supplies to Hayes County. So. This, I, I, wanna, I wanna just clarify one other thing that's in this pitch packet that was sent to all of our all of Remember, our I've not seen a pitch packet, just to be fair. I, I'm more than happy to provide it to you. I don't care um, to read it right now, but nevertheless. The, uh, it says we are, and this is again from the uh, MRG, you said. MRG account executive for business development. Um, he says we currently have relationships with over 25,000 grocery stores and major retailers, including Walmart, HEB, Target, where these, where these testing kits can be picked up if they don't have access to receive them in their place of residence. So a good idea would be maybe to call them and ask them what they meant, because I can't infer or interpret. And it's I much think it's pretty obvious they mean that if they can't get them in their place of residence via mail, that they could pick up these tests in a retail location at one of these 25,000 grocery stores that they have a, uh, a relationship with. And, and as, again, part of this packet... Um, I believe packet questions should be directed to the people that put it out. I think that's the only the reason way. I ask you this is because this packet was provided directly to you, Mr. Villalobos, and it was asked, is this legitimate? Are the people legitimate, I thought? I, I, can I? <laughs> so the, uh, the test and the way it's provided is what I'm referring to as far as legitimate. As far as the marketing stuff, I know I've, I've asked over and over again to ensure that that's correct in regards to how it's accessible. But I'll tell you, the, the way I've learned what the platform is about is that even if it was available through a retail operation, it still had to be guided through a doctor's supervision to get the test and to diagnose. That was my understanding, and that's my basic understanding of the platform in and of itself. That's, that's all I know. Here's the, here's the concern that I have. And, and, but, and what you're doing in your questioning is that you're calling forward my ethics, and you're doing it in a very public way. And, and I, I appreciate it because I think that the people need to understand that. But I understand what you're doing. Uh, my ethics are above reproach, and I've proven that over and over again. The process and me guiding not only you, but also other people in the court are providing my opinions. And some people may take my opinions and continue forward even re in a, without listening to what I have to say. And I understand that. You have your own agendas and you have your own direction to do things. And I, I can't control that. You have the right to make that decision. And with regards to are they legitimate, I feel like they are based on the platform that follows the, the FDA guidelines, um, that it has to be monitored by a medical provider. Not that you do it in in-home test. It's just not what I believe. Now with regards to access, I don't, I don't filter the access to that. That's not my job. My job is to say, is they ask me a question but they asked me a very loose question on, specific, on specificity. And I said, Martin, they are legit. And there was no further follow-up on that. And I haven't had the opportunity to sit down and tell them why I thought that they were legit, because there was no follow-up question. And I haven't spoken to them since with regards to that piece. Other, other issues in response to managing the management coordination of the county, absolutely. But outside of that, no. It's not a topic of discussion for me on a regular basis outside of being asked to, is this legitimate? Your question's about it. I'm telling you what, what I know about it. Uh, the judges uh, request uh, questions and, and, and direction and, and assistance with some of the documentation. I've provided it, and I've given them my caveats. Uh, again, some of those things are done outside of the purview of myself. I, uh, contrary to popular belief, I'm not with the judge every day. And to prove uh, it, just to chime I've, in I've, so we can keep I've, moving. I've, I've done quite a bit on my own and working with the staff to provide response for this emergency. And I'll continue to do that. And I'll continue to give you my guidance. And if you want to follow it, I, I understand that you have other agendas that you need to take care of and other missions that you need to take care of as well. And that's- My biggest concern, yeah. Mr. Villalobos, is the health and public safety of our citizens that's, here. That's mine too, and the, absolutely. The fact is, is that- And I've done it on point, the front lines for years, sir. And I, I, want, I want you to that. understand that. I appreciate that. Thank you. My biggest concern is at this point, what we don't know is much greater than what we know about this specifically. That's and the way it appears. to that point, if any of us 
anyone on this dais had been involved in any of these conversations, do you think we'd be having this conversation today? Absolutely not. And so to my point, even as, as relative to last week, we had a, a very similar conversation where we said, why don't we just brief us two at a time and, and get us up to date so we wouldn't have this conversation that we're having today. Has there been any effort to do that? Yes, there has been. And what, I what effort has happened to do that? Because I haven't, I mean, yesterday, whenever you called me about a different issue, I said, when are we going to do this? And that's the first that there had been any uh, outreach. Yesterday when we spoke, I told you that we were going to have to readdress the establishing our EOC for the county so that we can tailor our communication directly to the commissioner's court and smaller groups. Um, as I learned after yesterday that, uh, uh, well, some of the things through the training process, I also told you that we are going to build that and I would be working with our staff to create a communication piece that's going to be consistent and that was going to be guided to county, countywide operations or county operations response to, not countywide. I don't, I don't want to make sure that I'm not jumping on anybody's toes. It's county response to this mission. As a matter of fact, uh, I also said in the last thing is that I'll give you all of my responses for my 214s. And I have those and I printed those out today to give them to you. But I, I figure that a, 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 a regularly established DOC within the county would allow us to put together our IAPs, our individual IP, and our SIT rep to provide that on a regular basis to you. So those are the things that I've discussed with Mr. Reyes to start formulating so we can do that on a consistent basis. That, that's been my plan and that's my direction today, sir. And here's one more piece I want to add. I've also, for the record, I've asked Mr. Villalobos to um, try to locate uh, other sites for mass testing, uh, because my hope is to get us past this um, limited testing that we're doing. And so I've also asked them to um, probe for other testing locations besides what we have so we can expand our um, capabilities, because I'm all about expanding our capabilities, expanding who we're testing, continuing to test more people, because that's the right way to be. And so he doesn't know anything more than what I've asked him. And I do that on purpose because I know that Mr. Villalobos is a target for some people. And so I deliberately leave him out of things because I don't want him to be a target needlessly when he's just trying to do his job as an emergency management coordinator. So I say, hey, can you help me with this only? Or I'll say, hey, can you proofread this? Give me your opinion about that. Tell me what you think about that. Like I'll also ask Mr. Kennedy. I've also called our auditors. And I said, hey, tell me about this. Explain this other part. And then I walk away. I get their piece of the link of this chain, and then I walk away. Um, and I've done the same thing to Ms. Crumley, countywide operations. Hey, tell me about this part. Tell me about this part. Because it seems as though um, we have a real good opportunity to test our residents of Hayes County for weeks now, and it's been politicized. And all these attempts have been made, <coughs> writing paper, letters to the paper, uh, calling our senators and getting all these different people to write letters of opposition, but I've never actually received a call myself to clarify. And so I just fear that we're putting politics over public health. And so my biggest hope is to clarify that people know what they need to know and I've left them deliberately low on consumption because anyone that helps me seems to become a target. And I don't want that from anyone. I want to help preserve and protect, and that's my goal, and that's my priority, and that's all, I'm at, that's all I'm after, and that's all I'm up to. Well, Judge, but this is the first time that we've had the opportunity as a court to talk about this. I mean, two weeks ago, you made it clear that you did this on yourself without yes, consulting us, so that's why we're having to ask these questions. Now, we're not trying to... No, no, and that's good. We're not politicizing this. We're trying to get the information out, and, you know, I think that's why we are where we are now. I I think one of the, the biggest concerns that I have is when we talk about this, uh, the, the MD box solution, and we talk about the fact that it's a monitoring program, remove the testing from it. Sure. Completely remove the testing from it. When we discussed that program initially, um, the understanding was after that first press conference, and it was very public. I mean, that it, in the portion of that press conference where it said you you reach out to our, uh, to our telemedicine doctors. We will, you know, we'll interview you and um, you can, you know, you, you will have a, and again, there may have been some miscommunication, but it said you will be available or you will have a test made available to you. 
Um, there were numerous, I mean, we, we were told, you, you actually mentioned this, and I would love to hear what the, up, the updated numbers are from our MD Box folks, but within the first three days over, after that, over 3,000 people stepped up to use the service, was what you, you said. Mm -hmm. Do you, and forgive me, Ms. Altman, but do you have any idea how many people have used the service since that launch at the press conference? The monitoring service? Correct. I don't, but I can get those numbers for you and follow so, up with you. So my, my question is this, of those 3,000 people, whether those people, whether those citizens re received a test for COVID-19 yeah. or not? We didn't I, send, I, we didn't send any, we right. are not selling Exactly, that, that's my point. Whether they received a test or not, they paid a $50 initial yeah. out-of-pocket fee or no? No, they didn't. no that's not I'm true. I'm asking. That's what I just asked. If you would let them answer, I'd, re I'd really sure. appreciate it. No, that's not true. That's our, what my question is. So our monitoring platform is... Can you um, walk us through that? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so the monitoring platform, if I can remember from heart, it's covid19.mdbox.com. It's simply where you go and register your phone number, you put in certain vital information, you take your temperature, Here's my heartbeats per second, things like that. And you monitor every day you get a reminder to put your vitals in. And essentially what it looks for is if there's an increase in temperature or an increase in symptoms like shortness of breath or coughing, right. we recommend that you have either go to a local provider to, you know, because we're concerned because you've had a fever now for two days. We're concerned. If it's not severe and it's moderate, we actually recommend per the CDC guidelines that you stay at home and that's where telemedicine comes in, because you're able to see a provider, talk about those symptoms without having to leave home and go to a medical facility where there are likely people that are positive for COVID. So, so to that point, how many actual telemedicine visits do you think were driven by this, by that press conference and by the county, uh, the very public? I mean, y'all all had yeah. a number, uh, an uptick. I mean, definitely. I don't know how many were driven by that press conference. I know and I don't have them with me, I'm not our CTO, but I do know that we have a COVID consult on our MD Box platform, which is Correct. an app for telemedicine. COVID is one of the ones you can choose where you just talk to a provider about that. We've had a lot of people talk to providers because they're nervous, not because they're necessarily symptomatic, but it makes them feel better to talk to a medical professional and say, you know, Texas is a high allergy area, and a lot of the symptoms of allergies can often mimic. You might have a cough, you might have sneezing. You might be unclear whether those symptoms are something you should be concerned about in light of COVID, or if it's, it's just our oak pollen that so, happens every year. So you are able to buy a consult in our app for $49.95 to see a medical professional. That's a telemedicine visit. and has nothing right. to do with, with testing, and the monitoring is free. It's a free tool. And so I guess my question is, in that process, um, people initially, because of the miscommunication, mm -hmm. uh, thought that they, by going to this service, would be able to, to receive a test. Right. And, but in order to receive that test, they had to have a consult, which we all agree on, a medical doctor needed to see them first. Um, and so in order to get to that point where they could purchase a test should they need one, um, they had to go through a medical consult with yeah, a physician we, that was forty nine yeah. ninety. We have never provided tests for sale through our app. The only oh, place I, I we have that. provided tests for sale is through our drive up testing events, which we've just right. started. Um, I guess my point is, is that if I am, and, and this was an example that was given in the in the K View article or the K View piece, <coughs> that done, if I'm Joe Citizen out there and I'm concerned about my health. Mm -hmm. I see this, you know, this COVID task force that is in partnership with Hayes County. Mm -hmm. um, I'm directed from their release to the MD Box website. I, I see the box that says, okay, I'm, I'm worried about COVID. I'm worried that I may have COVID-19. So I select that. In order to find out whether or not I could even qualify for a test, I had to pay $50 for a, a telemedicine visit. And so my... So that's not true. That, that's test, what my question is. Right, is that, that's not I'm true. walking through the process, right. so please correct me. I, I would love to hear it. So for the testing events, we have a separate landing page where you go on and do a health assessment questionnaire. I have fever of, and you have to put the temperature. Based on mm -hmm. that, you can reserve a slot and then pay for your test at a drive through testing. The app is only for telemedicine-only visits. The KVU, um, I want to say article, the news story right. um, that came out, 
was erroneous in a lot of areas. First of all, the woman he was speaking never bought a telemedicine visit, her husband did, which we refunded the day after, which was five days prior to that story even running. So it was not true that they were out $50 because we refunded them within 12 hours of them saying to customer service, we thought this was that. No, I'm sorry, this is telemedicine. We refunded that to them immediately, which was not brought out in the story. The story clearly said they were out $50, which was not at all true. Our testing event that we've done, we've done one pilot testing event in Austin, in North, North Austin. Mm -hmm. um, it, people were directed through social media, through emails of practices to go to the landing page to fill out the health assessment. It was decided whether they were a candidate for testing. If they were a candidate, they were allowed to proceed to a scheduling um, app where we scheduled on 15 minute increments and we had a max number of people we would allow because we didn't want to create a traffic issue. And then those people showed up the day, showed their receipt that they had a slot, they were ready to go, and we took them through the process, which is windows up the whole time until they get to the tent where the medical providers are. They stick their finger out the window. They get you know, tested. The cassette is handed back to them as it has to develop for 15 minutes. At 15 minutes, through the app, they take a picture of it. That picture of the test is sent to our telemedicine providers they conduct a visit, and the telemedicine provider is the one who reads and interprets the test. None of the consumers are interpreting the test. That's done through our medical personnel. Based on those test results and the symptoms of the person at the time, our medical personnel will, and I'm not a doctor, I'm a scientist, PhD, um, they will determine what the appropriate care plan is for them, whether they need to go seek urgent, like it's bad enough, they need to go seek urgent care. They should just stay at home and monitor, continue to monitor their symptoms through our tool. Or if they're positive but completely symptom-free, likely they have um, gone through COVID infection and are now in the convalescent stage, the recovery stage. My, my concern, and, and as, a, as a scientist, and, and Doctor, you may have some input on this too. My, my biggest concern is that we've seen in places like Laredo where there's been a half a million dollars spent on tests, specifically lateral, these, these lateral serology tests. And the federal government steps in and just seizes all of them because <coughs> they, either the tests were either considered invalid or um, number, number two. And the, these are completely different manufacturer, completely different tests than what y'all have. I completely understand that. The concern that I have is that until we know that, I mean, to say that there are no serology tests that have received an emergency use authorization is just not true. There's one. Recently, just one new There's one. That's right. Just and now. And to say that they don't have to have one is untrue because to, to, they... That's not necessarily true. The FDA right. guidelines right. are that they are um, exhibiting... Um, Discretion, they are not objecting to the distribution of any of these tests provided the manual. Hey, use these tests, they're good, go test people. But instead, it's you know, high level government wording of we do not intend to contest the use and distribution of serologic tests for COVID 19. Da, 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 da. And I've got all the language I can show you guys. And honestly, I feel so much better, at least just kind of getting to explain what we're doing. Um, so thank you all for the opportunity at a minimum. Um, it's it, just easy, but there's a lot of confusion around that, the verbiage. But the bottom line is these tests can be used under the FDA, but there's requirements. And it basically says you can use the test so long as it's been validated. Well, what is validated? That's scientists. So validated means they get the test and they get serum, which layman terms, positive COVID blood. They take serum and test it to see. It's called colloidal uh, gold that's put on these little strips of paper that are put into these lateral flow tests. And then she's testing to see if they react. So the manufacturers in China, they have to validate them. Then they come over here and we validate them. Our new process is we get them validated over there and we get a video of it before they even come here. Then they come here, they go to a warehouse, and then we validate them at the warehouse before we issue final payment. And um, it's, it's a process to validate to show that the test is reactive to positive COVID blood, essentially. That's the bottom line on that piece of it. Then, 
Outside of that, it also says, so long as the FDA has been notified of your intent to use and distribute. So the manufacturers have got to lock in, notify the FDA, and then receive the response. So we make sure that we've got the notification, the response. So, um, you know, it's all legal and above board, but it takes a little bit of time to understand it and research. And I've got all that information. I'll share it. Happily. Yeah, and, and ju just by way of background, I actually worked on the Appropriations Committee for the Food and Drug Administration for five and a half years. <laughs> so you know the crazy. And language. so I'm I'm very familiar with the Office of Compliance. I'm very familiar with the Office of Approval, and, and I've worked with them in the past. And that's the reason I asked these questions. Yeah. I mean, it, the the fact is, is whenever we saw that initial press conference, and whenever we saw the the press releases that came out of all three companies, or all three names, I don't know what the company structure is, right. of our, you know, Re Reliant, Immune Diagnostics, MRG, and MD Box, all of those press releases and that press conference had some serious inconsistencies, and I'm glad to see y'all are nodding your head, yes, yes, this is the case, with what was actually, what is actually not, not necessarily, we won't use the word approved, but allowed by the FDA whatsoever. Right. And, and I, I appreciate you all understand that. I want you to understand that, that that's the reason that uh, whenever I have to, to lift an FDA ban of any type of testing. And that's a direct quote from y'all's company. Yeah, and, and, so, and so th that in and of itself is shocking to me. And so that's the reason you, you can understand why I have these concerns. <laughs> Yeah, after being it, here and listening and seeing everything that's happened, all of this makes more sense. But I was sitting <laughs> on the sidelines going, what in the world is going on here? But seeing, I get the dynamics, I see that, and I know that there were missteps. And I'm trying to be respectful of other people's opinions. I think we're probably trying really hard to do something. Um, but, you know, within two days, there was a blockade of, no, no more. You don't run those things anymore for that company. You guys took corrective happen. action quickly, and I appreciated that, too. Yeah. So I was like, uh, I, I don't, don't know about to, any of this. Please stop it. <laughs> like we can rehash. I'd rather not do it publicly about who was what and what was said and what didn't happen and who was excluded. I, I can go into all that. I don't see the need to drag a, a person or a company through the mud because I think it was an honest mistake. Um, and know. I think in closing, it's a good idea to just – recap all this i think commissioner you're done with your comments and questions i do have one more question the the, the document that was given to us today okay. is that under this provision or are we going to discuss that later in the agenda later okay and, and so and just and so, so you know i've got two of the tests here if you guys want to see them i'll show them what show you guys what they're like um it's they're here available so anything you want to see i'll open up my books my life i I'm i don't have anything to hide so come in dig as deep as you want but the you know, bottom line is try and do it fast because I, I truly believe uh, as deep as it can possibly be believed in my heart that we've got to do massive testing. And I, and I want to, the one thing I want, do want to tell you is I don't know, I don't know Nick who works with you, but I do know one thing that in all the emails with 30 something people on them from y'all's company, the judge and Alex, he's the one person that stepped up and said, we can't say these things. He's the one person who stepped up and said, we're offering this and we're rolling it out Monday. It's not even going to be available till Wednesday. And I don't know the guy. I respect his ethics because he did the right thing and stepped up and said, we can't do this. We can't say these things. A good guy. And so I don't know him, but give him my compliments because he, in this whole, in everything I've read, I will tell you, he's the one guy that I have the utmost respect for, even though I've never heard of, never met him, never heard of him, but I've read his name. I had my first real conversation with them yesterday, and, and I'd say the same. And my closing I comments for you guys, and thank you for taking the time to come here, because I want you guys to have the opportunity to take all these spins on what's going on and the word choices that have been going on, and I call them mischaracterizations of your effort, one way or another, good or bad. Um, I want to reiterate that the tests you guys have offered to the residents of Hayes County are manufacturer approved by the FDA. They are allowed to be used by the FDA. Can you clarify that? 
uh, is a manufacturer allowed? They're, they're, they're a listed <laughs> manufacturer on the FDA website. So does that help you? They are a registered manufacturer on there you the FDA go. website, and they're um, they have been listed as in a. A, a manufacturer whose serology test can be used for testing in the United States. And it's so, really tough because it's almost a gotcha. Same like, thing. And I'm not usually scared to talk, but I'm afraid to talk about FDA wording of author, authorized, um, approved, certified. But there is the whole process of, you know, there's a, essentially a stamp of approval on manufacturers in China from the FDA. I think that's called maybe it's certified. Um, the Chinese FDA. They're certifying lines. They're holding up shipments right. because they're ashamed of some of the stuff that's been coming out of China. One of our shipments that was supposed to be out um, two weeks ago, the Chinese FDA held it up and brought it back. They're trying to get it all reeled in. So there's both sides working to approve these. And our manufacturers so far, I think all of them have both the Chinese FDA or equivalent and the U.S. FDA equivalent of and again, please don't hold me to the words, but I think it's they've authorized or perhaps it's certified the manufacturing line saying, we approve of your manufacturing capability. We like how you do this, but that does not mean the test in itself is FDA authorized, approved, or certified. So that falls under the verbiage that we do not intend to distribute. So it's this whole walkthrough of how is it acceptable to have these tests? And that's what I want to, I mean, probably do a call like I know more about this stuff than I ever would have thought. It's been an immersion course for the last month. But a call with any emergency management service, any um, FEMA directors, whoever would like to see, I, I'm happy to walk them through it. And I, I think that didn't Dr. Dr. Legier do two similar calls with our emergency services folks? I think so. And so in summary, what I'm trying to do is uh, I'm trying to summarize so we can move on to the rest of our stuff. Sorry, guys. But my hope is to say you guys are using um, – stuff that is legal, that is intended to be distributed by medical professionals, and uh, you have offered free monitoring to the residents of Hayes County, and in the evolution of any symptoms, then they have the opportunity to be helped to a local provider, or telemedicine, or some other avenue. I want to summarize that you guys are representing a, a wholesome product, not a fraudulent one, representing a system that is uh, correct and medically backed by medical professionals, credentialed and licensed professionals. And that's what I want to summarize with in closing, because you guys deserve that clearing up of the misinformation. You deserve that. And I thank you guys for coming. Opportunity. Now, uh, I've got a question about the what we're actually posted for, I think. Okay. Um, I was going to wrap up on this piece on the... Uh, that's fine. I just before you go on the next item. Okay. So I was going to wrap up on our presentation of uh, the COVID. We took way longer, and I didn't want to cut our commissioner off, but we took way longer than I expected. And so I wanted to see if Mr. Villalobos had any more uh, pieces to share about our um, COVID update as a county. If we can continue the course, please. Alex Villalobos, for the record, uh, emergency management coordinator for Hayes County. Uh, I think the update with regards that I came prepared for was just to talk about a plan. And I think um, in, in, in lieu of the plan to start getting to the point where we can start uh, uh, at least three to four weeks out, maybe even a couple of months, so we can start looking and, and, and understanding what that might look like in the future. I know that there's been, uh, before I get into the plan though, just to recap on the, on the items that we were talking about as far as communication is that I have been in, in communication with uh, uh, Chief Reyes. Um, I have had a quick conversation last night because uh, uh, with, uh, with Mike Jones, and uh, we are hoping to plan today for uh, an operations uh, planning meeting to see what the EOC for the Hayes County, how it's going to be organized, and start planning on the communication piece, um, the response, the staff needed for response on behalf of that. And I think it's, it's just getting to the point where now at this point it's critical that we're going to have several different organizations throughout the county in their own right, their own political subdivisions under the public assistance uh, request. Uh, we need to start uh, uh, funneling a lot of that work through those uh, political subdivisions. Because from our understanding and speaking with Vicki and also some of my training yesterday um, with TDEM, 
was uh, that it comes in the question that each political subdivision may have to do their own individual public assistance request. And um, I will follow up today again with some more training and I've asked some specific questions and specifically the questions that you wanted to ask. I don't know if you were able to follow up on those questions with them or not I, since our discussion. I sent the follow up to um, back from that follow up email. So what that's what, what that has spawned off for me is to continue to get more information on, on how that looks. Typically in a response we would all a lot of the county response would come under one public assistance request. This is a little bit different in that each political subdivision. So the, what, what we're questioning is the idea is that the ESDs uh, for both fire and, and EMS, um, the cities individually would, may have to uh, apply and submit individually under our uh, emergency management plan. So my questions are just to kind of verify that through, uh, through the process. So yesterday was uh, a bunch of just talking about this is something completely different in response. This is something that uh, um, even in their own right is that they're still trying to figure out how we're going to do this. So I'm going to ask more questions on that. And if that's the case, regardless, is that we're going to have to centralize our operations to receive that data so that we can make the appropriate public assistance request for not only the county, but also help facilitate that process with the other political subdivisions as well. Um, Have we ever done anything like that? As far as splitting the EOC on any of our other disasters? I'm just asking. I no clue. Well, uh, depending on the response and, and what, what's needed for uh, various operations, um, my understanding is, is that uh, uh, even in a joint, uh, we use that to collaborate and to kind of use staffing efficiently, you know, because we, we have certain needs for each one and we have shortages and uh, we have lack of staffing in certain areas. But uh, I think with the countywide operations, I think it's something that we need to centralize so we can start creating the communications that you guys need on a regular basis. But then furthermore, make sure that we are looking out for the best interest of the county in a lot of the funding, uh, a, lot, a lot of the purchasing, um, a lot of the operations that we need to make sure that we are on task with. So that's, that's something that has been done in the past. Typically we do a joint, but we also have some operations that happen internally. It's, it's, it's the, it would be the same thing as, as we've gone through the, uh, through the daily uh, um, uh, uh, operational pieces, uh, the city will have their own policy updates and talk to their own people um, with regards to updates. What we've been doing in our joint is that we, I've allowed, and we've allowed the total uh, um, operational plan for each individual area to come forward and give updates. But what that's done for us, this has created some issues with um, the public, uh, the Open Meetings Act, right? So. Um, I think in smaller groups, we can probably be more efficient on that, and then we can create our own rotation on smaller groups to give updates, but then also start creating our own uh, um, uh, situation reports to provide to you, um, and just task more information coming forward so we can really be more detailed than what you're asking for. And I know that's something that uh, uh, several of you have asked of me. Um, uh, I think that the judge had made the, the decision that we need to start uh, under his uh, idea of caution is that we need to start understanding the operations for the county and start utilizing our, our own EOC to facilitate that process in an effective and uh, efficient manner. And uh, um, I'm leaning to that direction and working with the staff to create that platform but still be collaborative and work together with all of our entities throughout the county. And that, that's my mission and goal. Commissioners, any question for Mr. Villalobos? Well, this might be for you too, Judge, but are we, I've had several requests from business owners and mainly the grocery stores, are we going to maybe follow Travis County and require masks in public? So uh, I've had a conference call with our uh, general counsel, uh, Mark Kennedy and Jordan. Uh, that was, I think, over the weekend. And we had agreed that we were going to wait for the governor's order to come out, which I think just did. And uh, we're going to visit, go over the material and see how it fits our specific need because the way I've seen it is the governor puts out, I think this is the effort, puts out a statewide for the counties to then <coughs> personalize it to their specific needs. And so since that just came out, uh, Mr. Kennedy has been very awesome in making himself available and his office available to me, but we have not Sorry. had that meeting just yet. Did I capture that right, Mr. Kennedy? 
Right, Judge. The we did talk over the weekend, and um, and uh, my concern is that not knowing the content of this upcoming order, and I have yet to read it. I, I will do so today. Um, but the uh, the new order would likely, just like the last order, place limitations on the ability of local governmental entities to do certain things. So without knowing what that was, it didn't make any sense to try to draft something new here. It would probably create confusion if you see several orders coming out back to back. So make sure that it's a top down kind of um, um, pecking order. So That's exactly what we try to do you. is to be consistent as possible. And even in our orders that we've rolled out countywide, uh, we've done the painstaking effort of looping in every mayor and city managers and telling them, uh, Mr. Kennedy's been on some of those calls as well, going line by line, hey guys, do you understand what this is? Do you, do you uh, feel this is useful to you? And my goal was to create, like Mr. Kennedy just said, as little confusion as possible so we don't have 30 different orders in place to create something that everyone can follow in a consistent manner. And so we're staying with that theme and we're trying to see what the governor's march is and then see if we can catch the cadence. And yet with the most subtle personalization, maybe if necessary, add something for the county. And Judge, I was uh, just gonna say, I really appreciate the updates that y'all are um, providing and sharing with the cities and the mayors. But I also believe it's so important for us to be involved, uh, at least in the knowledge, um, you know, of, of receiving the information. Uh, it's so difficult because, you know, we're getting emails, as I know we all are, with people that are concerned, you know, what's the next step? What are we doing next? We need to, as you stated, Judge, you know, how do we get businesses going again, but still keeping uh, the priorities in check as, you know, we want people to be safe. That's, a, that's an interesting and and so but it's it's uh, really difficult when we don't have the information to share and provide and I know some of that information um, you know we have to be careful on how we roll it out but you know whenever it's available we need it because it's helpful to us also because at times it does feel that there are these conversations going on we can't partic all participate um, and so when you have it and we can get it, I, I would appreciate that. You bet, and I'm grateful that you guys have participated in the regularly scheduled Monday, Wednesday, Friday calls for elected officials because that's, that's a real good spot where we try to share, but if you ever, um, if you ever feel like you're missing something, always know that uh, Alex is available to you as well. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just trying to be as honest as I can and I appreciate your, your comment, but we're reaching out on many fronts, many times a day. And so my hope is if there's something missing, just, just ask for it so that we can make sure we capture what you're looking for specifically and we'll happily, happily, because all we're doing is communicating. So we'll happily share with you whatever you need. Well, in those uh, meetings that are happening on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's my understanding that we can't participate in those. You're anymore. there to listen, correct. You know, so, so uh, what, what I understand I also that they're recorded. That so I think what we can do is start sending the recordings to you, so you can review them as well. Because I, right. I think that that's something that some people have started doing is just sending the recordings, just so we can keep uh, keep within the the public uh, or the Open Records Act. I think that's what Open Meeting Act. That's, that's my concern. I mean, I'm sorry, the Open Meeting Act. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, the, to your point, Judge, we can't. One person other than yourself can participate in those uh, of the four of us, and we need to either coordinate that. Um, but even that being the case, there's a, there's an opportunity there when we only have three of those a week that one person is going to go at least a week without any update uh, unless we put some type of structure in place. And so that's the reason I have the concern that I have. Sure. I'd like to have those just emailed, I think, to the court yeah. when they're available. That would probably take care of effortlessly a lot of it right there if it's not mentioned in that call then we follow up with uh, well, with um, questions and you're talking about the recording sir yes. because uh, I'm taking notes but I'm taking notes that are direct towards my response yeah I would just say the recording be, okay, okay yeah. just recording. and I'm very grateful that our uh, uh, mayor from Kyle Travis Mitchell has I asked him to help me with that and he stepped up because and this is not a, on anyone but very often people will say well what are you doing well you're not doing enough of this or you're doing too much of that and you could put one bottle of water down and you'll have a bunch of people saying you didn't do it right 
in one way, you didn't do it, you did it too much in the other. And so I'm just very grateful that when faced with a lot of opportunities, I, I'm very thankful to the spirit of people saying, here's an opportunity, let me step up and help. And so big shout out to your Mayor Mitchell and Kyle that has uh, taken the lead on that communication piece and he records them all. And I know that he emails it to me. Uh, as soon as it's over, bloop, my email populates. So I'll make sure that everyone on the email list gets a copy of it because we all get a recording of it. Um, I'll make sure that everybody gets it. That way you can all be completely up to speed and, and communicate. And don't forget, you can always uh, reach out to our emergency management coordinator for any clarification. And I'll say that the, the mayors have reached out quite a bit, and I've had some really good conversations with some of them. Uh, early in the morning and late, late at night, uh, just going over uh, particular items that they had concerns about and different responses for different things. And a lot of them have offered to, to assist in many different ways um, because they agree with the overall response. Um, the phases, uh, I know that in, in respect to uh, Commissioner Inglesby uh, with regards to response and opening up and digging ourselves out of this, uh, this, 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 uh, the situation in this environment, I think that's probably the, the most important question that everybody's asking is how do we do this? I know that um, from the federal government all the way down to local government, we're trying to figure out that plan. Uh, no one has really come forward with a plan. They're having discussions on what the best options could be and what it may look like. Um, I think uh, part of my job is to present uh, something and then uh, receive guidance from all of you on whether this is something that coincides with uh, with Hayes County and our response for Hayes County, and, and uh, really, it's it's very fluid because it's something that's changing all the time. And if I come up with something today, it's going to change again probably by the end of the day. But at least the construct, like the bigger overarching theme of, of response, I think is something that we need to start looking at. And one of the best articles that came out thus far that kind of places all of those different things together from all of the largest institutions that are doing research on immunology to medical response. I mean, some of the biggest names in the business, but the one that really <coughs> honed it down uh, to something that was, um, that, that allowed me to understand what we should be considering. Uh, and I won't make any assumptions for, for anybody else, but as uh, Texas A&M. And uh, they're one of their, one of their, uh, um, one of the department directors who put out an article here recently, it's the five phases of the COVID response. And it really broke it down individually into responses and it, it looked like um, um, something that, uh, that I could write um, and then at least use it as the overarching construction of how we could respond within our county. Phase one is containment and containment has been where the national government has shut down uh, avenues of travel, right? Uh, we have shut down uh, different uh, businesses um, uh, and different ways of traveling within the United States to control that, to contain it, to keep it out as much as we can. That was our first response nationally. And uh, that is something that we jumped upon. You know, containment is preventative measures against the virus. Uh, it's keeping it from entering uh, our community. Uh, I know that there were travel bans that were placed. There were travel restrictions that were placed between interstate um, as well. Um, there was also some contact tracing to kind of understand the, the avenue and, and the, the pathway of which it was coming into the United States in a broader sense. And all of those started shutting down as we did contact tracing. A lot of that was done not only by confirmed uh, um, infection, but also by testing, um, testing in many different ways. Um, although there weren't many tests that were approved, a lot of the uh, research institutions were using their own tests just to kind of understand the pro you know, what was going on in our, in our world. Um, phase two was mitigation. Mitigation was um, slowing down within our own communities, slowing down nationally, which was um, measures of like closing down schools, universities, restrictions to social gatherings, uh, closing down businesses uh, unless they were deemed essential, which were all things that, uh, as far as a, a, as a response, we went through. Um, we identified essential workers, um, and then we also did the mitigation of economy. 
Um, and some of those mitigations were, okay, we're gonna shut your business down, but if you could still supply these types of goods and services from a delivery aspect um, that promoted social distancing, then we would allow it. And you've seen drive up, delivery, door-to-door -door delivery, all those different things were what we would call mitigation to the economy. What we're working towards, what we're trying to get to, to some degree, um, is phase three. And, uh, you know, some, some scientists say three to six months. Uh, some scientists say something different. And um, um, I'm not here to say which one's right or wrong, but what I am saying is at least we have an idea of what that looks like when we get to phase three. Uh, phase three is still a containment stage, but it's a scaled-in opening of businesses that would be uh, more of a plan that's uh, with a lot of collaboration and discussion with many different aspects of the government, uh, our business community, our community and in general, and what that looks like. So what I've done is I've, uh, in real, to get to stage three before we even do that, which is weeks and maybe even months ahead of time, is I've spoken with our task force, uh, uh, with the Chamber of Commerce and the, and, uh, and the economic development uh, team to start looking at um, how we identify those businesses. We were on a conference call, uh, I believe, over or yesterday or day, or day before, I don't remember. I'm yesterday so many, at noon. So many meetings. And I asked them to start helping identify which ones that you guys feel would be appropriate. And then shortly after that, uh, I guess maybe even 30 to 40 minutes after that, the president came out with something or, or something from national news that talked about how they would identify some of those businesses. And it's a, I guess it was the U.S. COVID task force has actually put this out. And the way that they describe that phase three implementation is first offices, second industry and manufacturing, third is uh, small uh, privately owned shops, and then restaurants and bars. And um, which each level have a mitigation plan after it so we can test and understand how that's affecting the infection rate, right? Um, we're, we're not there, so containment, anticipation of a, of a vaccine or some kind of treatment, uh, phase three is, is rebuilding the economic status of our, of our communities. Uh, it's the expansion of uh, lab testing. Um, all uh, levels of government, doesn't matter whether you're talking about the United States and all areas of research with regards to this particular infection, you can, you can, you can go to uh, Europe, we can go to um, uh, the eastern countries and, and, na and nations, and they're all, all they have discussed is that we have to have a plan to test our way out of so that we can build confidence in the decisions that we're making. Whatever tests those are, uh, regardless, but we have to figure out a way that, to, to utilize that to build confidence. So what does that look like when you're opening up businesses? Um, I know uh, with some of my staff, I asked, what do you think that looks like to kind of help uh, maintain some level of, of accountability. And um, I've only done some cursory discussions. I haven't had the opportunity to talk uh, with the other staff members what that looked like because I think it's uh, appropriate that I do. But that, what that may look like is, is those businesses would do um, temperature checks multiple times throughout the day. And if they found someone that utilized in the CDC screening process that met those things that they don't come to work, or they're identified as essential, they need to get tested. So then we would, it, would, it may look like something like uh, within Hayes County, we would say, we need to call the public health department and they would do their screening on that process and direct them to a test if they deem it's appropriate. Therefore, we can start building some confidence and some way of within those businesses to understand, okay, these, these are your, could be your, 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 uh, your visibility to the infection or this is how you're managing it, right? And until then, uh, when we haven't really discussed how long that process would take before you would go into each level of mitigation, but I think that's more discussion that we need to have, not only from the county, but still more research that needs to be done from the national and, and state level too on what that looks like. Um, that would also help us with flattening the curve and, uh, and then also make sure that we're very stringent on the hygiene uh, measures within those particular organizations, understanding this is what we're requiring, hand washing, hand sanitizer, um, uh, understanding that if you have any aspect of, inf of infection, regardless of what it is, you don't come into work, you call in, and then you start getting monitored that way. 
And I think that's a scaled-in plan from phase, from phase four as we continue to go forward and we get closer to a vaccine or some kind of treatment for it. And um, uh, phase four is vaccine is available or treatment is available. Um, so we, we start doing it that way. But the reason why you have to scale it in is so that you don't inundate the system because this vaccine or treatment is going to be stressed of availability. So we have to take those measures on the bigger plan um, nationally so that we're not we, we, we're able to handle what we have now. And I think that's what's been able to allow our epidemiologists in their office to take on such, uh, such a large workload is that we've taken measures largely uh, in front of a lot of the different areas in, the, in, in, in Texas, really. We've, 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 we've put those, those, uh, those measures in place a lot sooner than a lot of places did. So that might be, I haven't done the research on that, but that might be some reasons why um, we have such a, we have the affection rate, but we also have a, a large recovery rate too that's coming, up, right? Um, <clears throat> some people have asked, well, why do certain areas have higher incident of infection, confirmed infections? And I think the best question that's, you know, this, this, the most obvious question uh, in, in, in that particular area was provided by our epidemiologist. And I was you know, I've been trying to figure out a short way to say it. And he just was like straight to the point. Well, that particular entity has more availability of testing. They have more testing sites. So that might be a reason why there's a higher level of infection in that particular area. So for me to draw conclusions or assumptions from that would say that if we had more testing, you're right, our numbers would go up, but at least we would know those people that were asymptomatic and those people that really needed the services uh, to kind of pull through. So that's, that's, that's kind of a conclusion that you can draw from that, is that uh, we know those places that are limited in testing in our county the places that have access and easy access to those and have more testing sites, uh, as, as we know, is, this, is the city of Kyle, um, which have uh, consistently been a higher rate of infection, but then also a good rate of recovery too. So what, what phase, you... phase five, um, I mean, phase four typically is the, in, in the article and, and some of the things that we put together was uh, similar to the flu because it could be seasonal. We still have to, we have to take the precautions that in the winter time or in the fall that this ramp up back again because we don't want to get too uh, relaxed. Uh, we have to stay stringent. We have to have a process. We have to have mitigation efforts in, still in place as we continue to open up to, uh, to, to anticipate a second surge of, it, of, of, the, of the infection. And then phase five, uh, you know, where we're ultimately where we want to be is that we're getting to the point where we want to prepare for the next pandemic. And that's learning from what we're doing here, since it's such an organic uh, environment. It's something that uniquely none of us have uh, addressed. I mean, I have, my family has. I mean, I, I've, I've lost a great grandfather to the flu pandemic. Um, you know, multiple generations from that, you don't know what the losses are. So, I take my response very, very uh, personally. Uh, I do it because it's right for the people. Do my best. I'll continue to do that. Now I'm open for any questions on that particular uh, model. I did have one question, Alex. You, when you're talking about testing availability that we have now, we have seen from some of our testing sites that. Um, literally say, tell people to come because they, they have not had the volume that they actually anticipated um, at those sites, I guess. And, and so my question is, on a daily basis, are we, having a, are we having the sites where we do have testing in the county? Are they running out of tests? Do they not have enough to meet the need of the public that is there? Are we, are we as a, I mean, I know that we as a county get a certain number of tests we've been told on a daily basis. We're not using all those yet, are we? I mean, I, believe me, I believe all, more testing the better if it's valid and, and we can, and it, it's approved and those kind of things. I don't see a problem with that. But my question is, are we, have we hit that point yet? Well, uh, or have uh, you seen I, that? Well, uh, I think it also has to do with the process by which we have in place to address testing. Is it how are we screening them to get to that point? And if we're following the current CDC guidelines, which I'm not running the clinic, but I believe and I understand through the, our, our, our great staff that are doing that work, 
is that there's a screening process in place. Um, is it open, completely wide open to the public? I, I, I don't know how that works when it gets there. Are we opening it up to our indigent population that may feel as though they have symptoms of it, uh, whether they're tested on whether they do or not? Does it follow the protocol? Um, I don't think I don't think that's that's the case. Um, and so, if we were to open up the testing and say, "Hey, let's test everybody. If you have the symptoms, loosely have the symptoms, we're not going to question you. We're just going to test you." Well, then I, I don't think we have enough tests, quite frankly. And we would we would stress the amount of tests that we're getting on a weekly basis. Yeah, but good, uh, under the current plan. We don't, and, and, and those private clinics are doing their screenings as well, and they're only available to those organizations that, are, that they're screening for, that have a, a relationship with them. We have pockets of populations that have high risk comorbidities that are different than Travis County, that are different than Caldwell County, that are different than Colmall County, and if we open those up to those particular areas, just to say that, look, if you have any, any of these symptoms, come and get tested, I think we probably would test the amount of tests that we have, uh, the, the availability for those tests. I, I don't disagree with you on that. I, I guess my question, though, is though, the CDC's guidelines say don't, open, don't do that. Because of, it, a, because of a lack of testing. They, they said they're, they're doing that so that we don't inundate the system and not, be, uh, and not have the opportunity to test the people that are most critical. That's the reason for the CDC guidelines. The CDC guidelines are in conjunction and, 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 and in, in relationship to the overall national issue is that there's been a lack of testing. And just yesterday, to add to that, um, not to take this one agenda item so long, but we have, to summarize it, because I'm, I'm at the front of all this stuff, and I might speak more freely than Alex, we have created limitations, thresholds that you must meet to get tested, where I have had um, elected officials with a fever not get tested. Um, so I believe, Eric said this in yesterday's elected officials call, uh, each facility determines the guidelines that they're using. But at the same time, we had the director of the CDC yesterday on national TV say, we need more testing. So we're pulling off a, and I don't believe it's intentional. I believe everybody around is doing their best to do a good job. But I believe we're doing a, dub, a double speak or speaking from both sides of our mouth or however you want to think about it because we have enough testing, but only if you're in these dire straits can we test you. Well, then that's not, that's not useful because we really don't have enough testing for the truest need and to prove it, Less than 1% of our county has been tested. And I'm supposed to help draft an order with the help of all the legal professionals based on what's going on in our county, but less than 1% has been tested. How can I truly know uh, the infection rate of our county? It's, it's truly guessing. And so my analogy I woke up to was, I'm driving a, a flying a plane and the instrument panel is nothing but bare metal and all I get is a light at the end every time we get a positive and so I need more information. I need to know what my topography is below me. I don't, I don't know our penetration. I don't know how many people are walking around in Hayes County with COVID, asymptomatic, and I'm not trying to be an alarmist. But to shape pro policy properly, we need more testing so that we can know the depth. And everybody at a federal level is saying the same thing. National Institute of Health is saying the same thing. Um, CDC is saying the same thing. And the model that most often is pointed to is, well, CDC says if there's a person with COVID in the house, assume the rest are positive. But very often it drops out of the description that you would use that model when scarcity of tests is present. It's a, 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 just to reiterate, it's a management process, and that's what they've utilized to not to stress the system. And that's what we need to continue doing until we have the availability of tests that we can say, hey, we, we are confident that we can test in a, in a more aggressive manner, and, and we're just not there yet. And, I, and I'll show you, you know, in the current platform and what we're testing, uh, we have contracted with Premier ER to do some of the testing for us, and that's with regards to the availability of tests at 20 a week. 
And we haven't utilized all the tests there, but those are for uh, people that have been directed to go there based on the screening process and our first responders, in case we need to get them there quickly, we have a place where the, the county is, is managing how the tests are being distributed uh, for very specific issues, right? And just to start up that in a very minimum amount of staff, it's, it's costly to the county to the tune of uh, $750 a day to maintain and, uh, 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 the clinic. But the, 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 the comfort in that is that um, we're at least able to manage something for our first responders, healthcare workers, first responders, people that are out in the front lines to get something done for them so that we can understand how we get them back to the front line. Right, because they want to be out in the front line. They don't want to be. They don't want to be infected with this stuff. They don't. Um, and then some of our other people that are directed by our our, um, our epidemiologist. But those costs amount, and the reason why is, is the overall operational plan for that. It requires a lot of equipment. In those current molecular tests, if I could it just quickly, so we can understand how it's done. The swab up into your your, your sinus cavity almost back of your throat. So typically when you have a swab do that, what happens? A chew. I sneeze or you gag or you cough, right? A lot of times, right? And when you're wearing, uh, when you're trying to get prepared for that and you have somebody providing the test to you and doing that, you have to change your PPE for each test. Because if you're doing that, then you, you don't want to affect somebody else. So you have to change it. Everything changes out. It's just, it's a, it's a whole package. And uh, you don't want to pass it, so that's the cost. And then you have the cost of actually getting the equipment that they need, because that's stressed out too, which is the, tech, you know, the, the gown or the Tyvek suit or the face mask or the clear met glass mask that they, that they need to use to do that, and the gloves. Um, it requires an operational plan that has a lot of materials that's needed to do that in that type of environment, so. Are there any other questions for Mr. Villalobos so we can get off this agenda item? So that'll be something they'll bring forward for approval for costs because we're still running that. And I know that I've asked um, a couple of questions um, with regards to that testing center and uh, what, it, what it requires to put together. It's two nurses and one EMS technician and uh, some other people that are there to help provide the operational plan. And we can scale that down if we need to. Um, but uh, currently, that has been the recommended uh, response to that clinic to, to operate it appropriately is what we have there now. So again, I've spoken with our, our preparedness, uh, uh, Mike Jones, um, and uh, have spoken with him about that and how we could scale it down if we needed to. And he's given me some opportunities to discuss that. But uh, I'll be submitting these, these invoices here fairly soon for the, for the cost of that. And it, it's not cheap. And Judge, I know that um, Eric is here, um, and I, I wanted to ask him a question because I know that we've we've done some question uh, we've done some tests at our health department. And Eric, can you just kind of run us through what that process is once you do get test uh, test someone with all that PPE on, and you know what that process is. Uh, I'm not doubting what Mr. Villalobos just said, but I just want to see because you are, y'all are doing some of that and how that works. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Eric Schneider, epidemiologist, Hayes County Health Department. Um, to clarify first, we are not doing any testing at our location at the Hayes County Health Department. We don't have the PPE. We don't have the staff. That's why we've partnered with Premier mm -hmm. ER for them to do testing for our first responders, health care providers, and then anybody else that we deem necessary because they might have come into contact with a vulnerable population. Okay, so it's not d being done, no testing is being done at the health department? No, ma'am. Okay, I thought that we were for the first responders. No, ma'am, that's okay. also being taken care of at Premier ER during, okay. but they do require a referral from me or from a provider for them to be able to get in there. Most of the time with the health care provider or first responder, it's a referral that is signed by me to get them in there. It's basically their golden ticket to get into our testing facility to where they can be tested. Um, the lab reports are usually getting to me within 24 hours, and then I'm contacting them with their results. Thank you for the clarification. And do you know the process of when that happens and when that test is done? Um, yes, ma'am, I do. It's 
not something we really want to completely make public because we don't want them overrunning the area, but it is open for our healthcare providers and first responders, and then anybody from the public that we deem necessary that has been in contact with a vulnerable population. I wish we had more testing throughout Hayes County. I wish there was uh, more that we could do, but we want to also make sure that we do have a viable test that actually detects a present virus, somebody who is currently infected with the virus and not somebody who might have been infected months ago. And, and when you say viable test, um, I'm not sure what designation this serology test that we've kind of been talking about today. Um, are there other serology tests? I know there was one mention that had an EUA designation. Um, but are there other tests other than that one, I guess, that you, anybody, feels comfortable using if, in fact, more tests need to be performed? In my opinion, the antibody test will have a uh, great benefit in the future to be able to determine who had this, who tested, who wasn't tested and possibly had this, or who has future immunity to this. But during a pandemic response, it doesn't, it is pretty useless as far as detecting exactly who is currently infected. Um, also with the CDC's guidelines at the moment, in order for a case to actually count as a positive case and for us to get that tally on our numbers uh, is requiring a molecular test. Uh, they have not changed it. They are talking about addressing antibody testing since it is new. But at the moment, molecular testing is the only thing that actually counts towards case count for a county, city, state, or even for the United States. Um, so while testing more people with antibody testings will give us a better idea of a screenshot of how Hayes County is going at the moment, uh, it will not increase our case numbers in any sort of way. And I know that we have an agenda item on, Judge, uh, later on uh, for a grant to purchase additional testing, molecular testing. Um, and so are, is there the availability, sufficient availability um, for the purchase of these tests that we are anticipating purchasing? Um, in a sufficient amount. I mean, I know it all comes down to money, to funding. Um, that is a future agenda item. We can expand on it then. What do you guys think? Because this is just presentation mode right now. Yeah, we can do that. Just so we can keep moving. Are you guys good with that idea? I don't want to shut you up, no, Commissioner, no. but I wanted to address it at the time when the agenda item was listed. Is that okay with Absolutely. you guys? Yes, okay. Mr. Schneider, thank you very much. We appreciate it, and I'm sure we'll call you back for the next one. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and at this point in time, we'll take a five-minute recess. <laughs>
that was it. Okay, so we don't have anybody waiting on that item, so I was getting out. I think these candies are going bad. Yeah, and I think 18 is the only thing one people are here for. Who's that lady talking to Alex? I, I thought she may have been with the women. We ready, guys? And if. Well, please open agenda item number two just to stay in order. Get rid of presentations and proclamations. Number two, presentation of letter from Hayes Caldwell Women's Center regarding the Child Abuse and Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Month. We have a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Judge Bassetta? Yes. And will you please open up number 18? Well, it's all fresh in our minds. Number, number 18, discussion and possible action to purchase and distribute COVID-19 tests and other products and services related to COVID-19. And this was my agenda item. Uh, I've asked our general counsel to leave uh, something on the agenda because at the beginning of this, I, um, I kept forgetting to ask to put an agenda item on. And so this has been the ask to leave something on there. And so my bad has been fixed and now it's on there. My hope is to uh, expand testing of the residents of Hayes County. Our current model has us testing very low number of people. And although um, it's, I consider it a, a false positive in, in my mind in trying to shape policy around what's going on in our county, I believe uh, following the national model of uh, National Institute of Health and the Centers for Disease Control director just yesterday, I was happy to hear it, and more people at every turn are saying we need to test our way out of this, we need more testing, we need more testing, we need more testing. The current model we are using, the current roadmap we are on, uh, so far has us with less than 1% tested, and it's, <clears throat> it's going to choke us out as a community. We need more testing, and so my hope is for us to allocate um, funding for testing of any kind, as long as, of course, it is legal and vetted. That's an easy way to summarize it, because we won't be subject to scams like other people may have been. Legal vetted testing of any kind, because I know that uh, the 15 minute test, for example, is a test that can help shape our roadmap to getting back to work, knowing who's uh, been infected, who's immune, who's asymptomatic, who's able to open up shop again. My hope is with an intelligent science-based approach with proper da data, proper uh, documentation by medical professionals to get us on the road to recovery. And I believe that um, me listening to the national organizations on that direction is a sound road. And I am uh, asking the court to, uh, among other things, approve money to buy tests. I've, I've, and to clarify, from our previous presentation, I've secured access. Excuse me. That's me. That's me. I was going to hit that gavel just to make a joke. <laughs> I've, I've secured access to the residents of Hayes County, but that access is fleeting. Um, and so those, the access that I've secured for the residents of Hayes County would be self-pay, for example. And so it's important. Um, some information got out before uh, it needed to. Some information. Uh, we're all excited about victories. We've had lots of unsuccessful attempts at N95 masks, among other things. Uh, this is a wonderful victory uh, for access of testing because we know there's a regional, state, and national shortage of testing. And so, um, as our epidemiologist just said a few minutes ago, this testing is going to be good to tell us the penetration in the county, know how many have been infected, and allow us to, again, create a roadmap to bringing us all back to work. 
And that's my hope is to, with this agenda item, bring dollars to, um, to purchasing more tests, more than the rate that we are at, more than the, the pace that we are buying them at. We need something much, much more aggressive. Is there a specific request, Judge, other than just say we want to do more testing? Do you have something uh, the, specific? The specific request is um, to pick a dollar amount that we as a county are comfortable with, dedicating to tests, purchasing of tests. Uh, I know that um, different communities are doing different things. Uh, Marcos has allocated $500,000 for uh, PPE, among other things. So I want to see the pulse of the community, of the court, because my hope is to have county purchase tests, whatever, um, whatever they look like, so that we can test our vulnerable population at, uh, at a more accessible, more uh, rapid rate than what we're currently doing. So it's dynamic and it's fluid on purpose to hear what you guys find uh, most useful and can support. And who would administer the test? Medical professionals. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Who, who would make the determination on Whenever you say the most vulnerable populations, who would make that determination? I had that conversation with our uh, our very own Mike Jones, and he has helped me shape that uh, conversation to say, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, to say the vulnerable population in reference to um, uh, pre-existing conditions and access and overall vulnerabilities, and then those in the medical system and first responders. There's a whole echelon that Mr. Jones, if you feel uh, inclined to, approach the podium and expand on that if you don't mind. And uh, basically to provide these with as few barriers as possible to those that aren't necessarily first responders as well. And the reason I ask that is we, last week when we had this conversation, we talked about those those CDC guidelines, specific guidelines on what populations should be tested mm -hmm. first. Yes. And um, when we talk about uh, vulnerable populations and where those are, just general, general public who have symptoms is the absolute lowest, uh, lowest rung on that. And so I'd it'd be interested to hear how that, how that CDC guidelines figure into the, the testing regime that we would possibly look at. In summary, if you can recap what we shared as a conversation and how you did point out to those guidelines as well, and just recap what we've discussed and, and what you uh, suggested and I agreed with. So Mike Jones, Hayes County Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. Um, so when we look at our vulnerable populations across the board, we look at the elderly, the young, the folks that have underlying conditions, and uh, I mean, the, the entire list. I wasn't really prepared to, to actually Id itemize all the vulnerable populations in our county. I can bring you a sheet and also send it to you later on. But I believe our CDC guidance is, is exactly that. The idea here is not to waste our monies on testing uh, just to test everybody. The idea here is to, to we're, we're actually triaging people before they come into the testing solution to the site, which is pretty much what we've been doing over there at the Premier ER uh, up to this point. Mm -hmm. And our vulnerable populations, as it comes to that, is really just communication getting out there and p ensuring that people know the pathway in order to facilitate getting tested if they need to. Again, the medical professionals come into play at this point. They still need to be talking to that physician or going through the community care or going through our energy care for the, uh, for the county and then walking that process through. Because as was so aptly stated earlier, we are an, al an allergy state. So we have quite a few things out here that can be false positive, so to speak, that you have COVID, but you really just have an allergy. Congratulations, go home and take some, you know, take right. appropriate drug. Uh, if I talk too fast, just let me know. You're doing great, thank right. you, sir. Yeah, but, but overall, uh, from our testing standpoint, the, uh, our vulnerable population is, is really no different than what the CDC has stated on, online. And granted, and I believe the CDC aptly states that if you feel sick or have symptoms, then stay home and, and quarantine yourself and let's not waste anybody else's time. And we have other folks out there that are, may, may need the, uh, the doctors and our health professionals' uh, consideration much, uh, much more stringent. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So it wouldn't really be any different than what we're already doing. Right, but except we would, uh, my goal and hope is to add testing because I don't know if you're catching the tone of what's going on, and sometimes it's a little confusing, but the current roadmap that we're on is very limited. And to prove it, you can see how many people we've tested. So my hope is that we put some taxpayer dollars behind testing uh, more people of the CDC recommendation so that the tests that are being used now can further expand so that we could 
loosen um, some of our guidelines of testing or encourage medical facilities to, to test more people. The goal is testing more people. So, so are you saying think, just you want to increase the budget of what we're paying Premier? No. What I'm saying is I want us to allocate money specific to buying tests so that we could. But that's what we're doing through Premier already, isn't it? Mm, could you expand on what we're doing with Premier? Sorry, Ms. Crumley. I believe the question was who would be performing the test. And then so, he asked uh, what Premier but I'm, doing. I'm still confused as to who you're suggesting would be performing the test. My first goal is to get them, and then the second goal would be to give them to medical professionals, as I have also stated to our epidemiologists. You take the tests and you put them out in the spaces so that we could determine uh, what medical operation, medical professionals, medical facility would best be suited for it. My goal is to bring more tests to Hayes County, and, and it, stays, it stays the same and it's consistent. Bring more testing to Hayes County and allow our professionals to put that in the hands of those that will do the medical oversight. And, and if we were to move forward with purchasing additional testing, who would determine what tests are purchased? Oh, I, I personally don't care. I just, I just want more testing. So we could have our medical professionals decide. I'm not interested in picking winners and losers. I'm just interested in more testing. All right. I mean, so would it What's be the plan the, for testing? The plan is to bring more testing to the county so that we will be more free to, more willing to test more people because right now we're But do we have a plan? Do we have a plan like, Eric, I mean, is our medical professionals, whether they're through our medical authority, um, hospitals, uh, anyone in the medical profession, is there a plan? Is there some communication of a group that says how should we best test the public of Hayes County? Is it done by private providers? Is it done with telemedicine at uh, consultations? Is it done at a parking lot somewhere uh, with county employees, or is it with uh, hospital employees? I mean, what's the All what's the, the discussion? But so, what is the? But I mean, there was has to be a plan. Through the health department, we don't yet. We haven't gotten that far. We haven't moved to the next phase. Right now, we're still in the initial phase. We set up for the, I'll call it the emergency plan mm -hmm. to set something up that was available to our first responders and our medical um, personnel in Hayes County. That is through Premier and um, CPL Labs. We're going to work on, uh, we'll have another item that comes back to court to tighten up our um, contract with them to provide these services that we set up on an emergency basis. Um, we could expand on that uh, and provide more testing. We could also look at, you know, making it countywide and having different standalone ERs um, participate. I mean, there's another, you know, there's whole other options that we could look into. We haven't gotten there yet um, because we've just been focusing on, on the last couple of weeks and what we had available. Um, we have some grant funds that are another item that we could look into amending the budget for on that submission. We haven't gotten there because we haven't, you know, had the time to look and see what we were going to be um, receiving from DSHS. So, Tammy, are you part of the task force to look at this? I mean, I, I am not. I'm, there's not one in place. Oh. But why is it referenced on here, Hayes County? Again, Hayes that's County. not anything at this point in time to, to talk about. I'm not going to talk about that item. I learned things through uh, uh, our oh, last conversation. No, this, that's not doing. Do that. oh, no, okay. that's got nothing okay. to do with the conversation right now. Sure. I'm getting to this. Uh, I'm not going to bring that piece up, no. I'm still uh, on a general piece. Yeah, you could, you could scrap that. I'm telling you that right now. You could scrap that piece of paper. Um, I'm talking about buying tests, period, for Hayes County. open those up together yeah. yeah why don't we do that so let us get to through this one and so the hope is um, then we could open the other one sorry so is has there been conversations about expanding the way we're testing now in other words adding capacity to how we're testing now to 
include other groups, not just first responders or healthcare professionals? There have not been conversations. We need to have those. Yes. Now that other facilities are willing to perhaps take on those responsibilities and, and offer their sites for testing, then we can have those conversations with them. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying, Ms. Crumley, because more and more people are coming online, as you heard of MB Box, uh, their willingness to come online as well. Uh, Mayor Mitchell sent me uh, late last night can an you, email sorry. about... Let me clarify that. I'm sorry. Any grant funds that, were spend, that we spend on that need to be the metabolic... Um, I'm sorry, molecular, <laughs> the molecular uh, tests that are the PCR tests. And testing. that's why my ask is any tests that we, um, for that grant item, yes, for the other agenda item, my ask is for any testing to take place, because right now we are hyper, hyper governed. It's like, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but I'll just say it. There's four commissioners up here, and I'm holding two pens, and you guys can ask me, do I have enough pens? Yes, I do. But nobody's asking me for a pen, so I have enough pens. And so I'm, I'm sorry to say it that way, but we have enough tests because we're not opening up enough access to the tests. And what I'm trying to do is change a trajectory. And Ms. Crumley is exactly right. We're not there yet. And as I pointed out earlier, um, I asked Mr. Villalobos to start uh, trying to spot some sites for more testing. But he, there's, there's nothing except the ask of him to try to secure some more uh, conversations about, not secure, um, identify it. More testing, facility, more, te more testing sites because we do need more testing. That is the universal understanding. And so I am, as Tammy just said, we haven't talked about it, but I am getting uh, this agenda item on here so that we could be proactive because I believe if we put an order for some tests, we may not get it. And so that's what my hope is to create a line item to get tests that our medical professionals are good to go behind. Get, getting sites, I don't think, would be the problem. I think we've already identified several sites that have already said they're willing. It's just getting staffing. And to, so to, getting to, the materials, materials to expand the testing, because right now it's hyper sites aren't the problem. Yeah. We the have other, been meeting the needs through our current test site current, for yeah. the first responders and the medical profession and those that are working with the vulnerable population. I, we I have met those needs. To, to use your example, if you want to hold sure. your pens up again, yeah. I. This is the concern that I have. And uh, I think it was put into, I think that Eric did a good job of uh, explaining the concern a moment ago. Um, and if you could go ahead and lift your pens up again. I, there, there are two pens there, but one's a highlighter. I think that they both write, but we don't know how good they are for the job that we're asking them to do. And the question that I have and the concern that I have whenever we just say, we, let's just, we're just gonna put a line item in there, leave it open for, increased testing and not clarify what we're using it for. I think that we need to know why we're using it and whether or not we're going to have the ability to get reimbursed on it in the future. Uh, but more importantly, is it doing the job that we're asking it to do? And I think Eric did a good job pointing out that there are only certain tests that are going to do the job that we ask them to do right now for the emergency response that we're dealing with. Depends on your perspective. I, I'm going to stick with the... I, exactly. It's not my perspective. It's my, my dependence upon our officials that we've given that ability to. I mean, he's our epidemiologist for a reason. And he's and also so, said something else, too. And, and so I guess my question is, I don't doubt, to, to go back to your example, I don't doubt that we need more pens. Buy a box of pens if we need them. Just make sure that we need pens and not highlighters. Make sure they're exactly what we need. And, and that's, what, that, that's the point that I, I'm trying to make here today. I, I, I would judge, I would absolutely support increased testing in our county. If it's the right testing and our medical professionals say this is the testing we need, um, but the problem I have is just saying, okay, well, we're going to go out and buy tests and then we're going to find somebody who can present them for us. We need to make sure that we have those medical professionals who are willing to use those tests, who are from here, who understand uh, the need and uh, that we actually need him first. And that, that's, that's what my only concern, and that, that we'll get paid back for him at some point from the federal government. That would be helpful are too. The, we, and we don't want to end up like tests the only ones that are reimbursable at this point, do we know? My understanding from DSHS is those are the ones that they will cover. So the reimbursable piece, I'm, I'm okay with allocating taxpayer dollars to test our community. 
Uh, I'm personally okay with that idea. And if we didn't get reimbursed for a particular test, but it was able to test our community, our vulnerable community specifically, which is a target with this line item, I'm okay with doing that because our residents are worth the investment of their own tax dollars back to them for testing. Second, as Commissioner uh, Jones has stated, we have an infrastructure in place of medical professionals. What we want to do is provide them more tools to test more people. Wonderful. Third, I've said, in quoting Eric Schneider, he said uh, what Commissioner Smith has said about the test, but he's also said that uh, the other 15-minute test would also give you an understanding of, I see it as an administrative policymaking perspective to know the penetration, the infection rate that our community has had with COVID-19. So I'm suggesting that we put a line item, we allocate money to it, and after that, we let the medical professionals take it from there. Securing the tests can be something that our professionals can help with, and then once they're secure, they can give them to the medical professionals that we have a good network of, and locally, and uh, by providing more tests in our county, we will automatically test more people. Which medical professionals are you talking about? Whichever ones have shops here. But I mean, what, are, what do the medical professionals want? You know, I'm obviously not a medical professional, but the medical professionals in our community, what are they asking for? Well, it depends on which ones you're asking. Some medical professionals, like uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, National Institute of Health, is recommending uh, mass serology testing. Some other medical professionals uh, are saying, we want only molecular. So the assortment is varied. That's why I wanted to stick to something from the word go that was consistent from the federal level, which is test more people. Because right now, our current model, however many times you hear, we have enough tests, we have enough tests for hyper scrutiny of, of, of who we're testing. But in order to open it up, I feel that we will challenge that headcount of tests, and that's why I want to bring more tests to these professionals that are already testing, so that we can say, here are more tests, please loosen up your uh, guidelines so that you can test more people. So, so will we be purchasing only FDA-approved tests? Well, there, aren't, there are no FDA-approved tests right now that are no, used right now. No, the Abbott Labs are approved FDA. Judge. Oh, uh, that's... Uh, there, there are FDA approved tests. Okay, yes. so if you, if you can get a hold of Abbott Labs test, perfect. This would qualify. And that's, I mean, and, and I think that's what our health professions are telling us is to only use FDA approved tests. Right. I think that's the letter we got from our local uh, medical doctor. And, and the only problem with using only FDA approved tests is we will stay where we are, which is no testing because it's not available. But I also don't want the other tests that they're saying, the reason they're saying not using them is because of the low accuracy rate, I believe. I, and I don't want to sound like a professional medical but you, person, but I believe the medical accuracy, um, well, we actually have someone that's in the audience. Do you mind just keeping it short? Because I really want to keep moving. If you just take one second about accuracy. I'm sorry, Ms. Crumley, if you let them in for one second. Just generally speaking, if you don't mind. Right. I'm sorry. It's just there's so much discussion. I know the answers to a lot of it, and I've got to go. But um, the challenge is, you're right, so Abbott... Um, and their thing, once their manufacturing gets ramped up to full capacity, they can produce 50,000 tests a day. So that's um, per week, 300,000. So that's per month, 1.2 million. So in the next three months, that's 3.6 million. We already kind of ran through the math earlier for what we need. In the U.S., we need probably 100, 100 plus million. Last night, there were um, codes. It was passed to where insurance will reimburse the serology test. And they're both important, in my opinion, as a non-medical, non-clinician. I think they're both important. One indicates earlier on, and there's higher levels of accuracy. And I think it's not the test itself. It's more in um, how it's done, the provider doing it. It's uncomfortable. So you have to make sure you're getting a good specimen. Um, serology, it's, it's pretty hard to mess up. Um, it's you know, fairly simple. Blood goes into a well. Um, the buffer goes in. But the challenge that we're in is there's such a limited supply. 
And I can show you guys this. I can validate. I've been looking into it and digging into it for a little over a month now. And the supply is just bought up. And, and just so you all know, and this isn't to come across as pompous, but the 2,000 tests that we're holding, I'm not, I don't even care if you want them, great. If you don't, great. And while I was here, we just sold 100,000 to one very large group. Um, I've got calls today, another one for seven million, another call today for 500,000. So the volume of tests isn't the concern at all for me. If y'all want them, great. If you don't want them, that's fine as well. I don't care, but I am telling you guys, the, the supply is very limited. And um, I think we're the only folks I know that have validated five manufacturers. Doesn't mean the next batch comes over is gonna be perfect. Doesn't mean that the, the buffer's stable and everything's fine. But we'll find out when we get them here and we test them. Um, and to me, it's less of it's, this is something that was put on me way above me um, to do. And I just know that we need them. So that's kind of been a driving force behind it. But I really do appreciate you guys. And I know that we could work together as a team to help with the solution. I can show you guys the, the four different models for testing that we've put together. Um, I can give you, you know, as much insight as y'all would like. And so I'm open to talking with um, emergency management or whoever, but I really wish y'all the best of luck. Love Hayes County. Owe a lot to this school, this town. So thank you guys. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Did I hear you say earlier though that your tests are $79 each? No, the tests um, for Hayes County, what we had talked about originally was I think $19 a test, which is only um, a few dollars over our landed cost for those tests. Um, a lot of them we're selling for quite a bit more, frankly. And uh, depending on volume, we can get better deals if folks, um, it's, it's a, that's another challenging situation. And um, frankly, I've, I'm refinancing my house to buy more of them because no state, county, nobody wants to put the money up front in China to get the test over here. They don't want to. Nobody's wanting to take that risk. And the only thing, we're not buying existing inventory that's sitting on a floor in a warehouse somewhere. That's gone. We're buying future production from these manufacturers. So we know what they're producing, what their capacity is, and just got a text while ago. Uh, one of them, the max they will give us is 200,000 a week, but we have to prepay and buy those in advance. And these are, again, the tests that um, show the antibodies so you know that somebody's had it, is immune, and then we're working on a solution with a, a group to where I don't want to get too far Yeah, ahead, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you very much. And you see that last piece, just to go off of that, uh, the antibody test is one of the mechanisms that I feel I could benefit from thank you to for your time. put us back to work. Thank you. I start identifying the population, start sifting through who's had it, start moving through all that. And again, the current model doesn't allow us that. So we could, we could uh, say this would be for Abbott Labs only, um, but I don't want to pick winners and losers. I'm saying we put a budget item for more testing and let the professionals go with whatever they can get, whatever is useful, because we can say, I'll buy 10 million purple elephants, and here's the money for it, but if there are no purple elephants, you've bought none, and we've benefited nothing. And so my hope is, leave it to the medical professionals. Uh, there's more than one thing on our mind, in my mind, uh, than just uh, clicking numbers on a front page of a paper. Uh, it's important to me to determine who has been infected. It's important to me to know who, um, who has the ability or even road mapping for an ability to go back to work. And that's the piece that's extra special for me on this front. So a uh, line item, agenda item number 18 is asking for uh, dedicating money to what the CDC calls our front line, our vulnerable population. And, and last week we approved a uh, budget amendment, did we not, for COVID-19 response? Uh, that was uh, like personal protection equipment. I think, it, I mean, it would, we, we put together some language for um, a different process for the purchase of those items, but that, that those funds are set aside for COVID-19 response. For supplies, but not for testing. I, I would assume it could be for anything. Right. Depending on the value of the item. So, all that money is sitting in the. Um, 
did you say that was 75,000? Is that what? Yeah, but we had a right. Where are we? What funds are used for the tests that we are currently purchasing? That it will come out of that fund, right? So, and that that program I understand is to be refined. The current testing program. I believe it can be refined. And I, I'm going to keep asking this question about everybody, whether it's our public health department, our medical authority, the community. I mean, I think it would be ideal to have a plan for how you roll out testing. We have money set aside already. We could definitely add to that. But it seems like we need to have a plan for what you're going to do, because the last thing we want to do is confuse the public anymore. We want to understand what we're trying to test, who we're trying to test, what we're trying to gain from testing. I believe the medical professionals, because again, I am not one, that if they say we need more testing, then I believe we need more testing. So how do we do it? And what are we trying to find out? It seems like the conversation of molecular and serology are two different aspects of testing, not just two different types, but, but have to do with two different things. You know, the, the, I looked this up from the FDA, and, and I know each serology test has to make these statements. It's, it's a requirement by the FDA. It says this test has not been reviewed by the FDA. Negative results do not rule out COVID infection. Follow-up testing with a molecular diagnostic should be considered to rule out infection in these individuals. Results from antibody testing should not be used as the sole basis to diagnose or exclude COVID-19 infection. Positive results may be due to past present virus infections. So that's what I'm hearing from the medical profession that the serology tests are, used, are not used for diagnostic reasons. That if you're trying to determine who is positive, you want to look for the actual virus in the person, whereas these tests have value in more of the, um, later on, the statistical review uh, when you are opening up businesses and you're trying to design plans that that information could be valuable. But it's not a, to me, it's not a healthcare tool about the individual. It's about a a, a, yeah, a, a, some statistical analysis. And so if we're going to open up testing, whether it's one or the other or both, I think there needs to be a plan of how that is done, how it's rolled out, who operates them, um, so that we don't confuse people and saying, oh, I can go get tested. I went in and got tested, and I don't have it, so I can go, go back to work. I don't think that's, I mean, that's no different than me if I got tested or not tested. And those are, the, I mean, and that's where I want to hear from the medical profession of how best to do it. Um, if we're trying to diagnose people that have it, then it seems to me the molecular test is the way that the medical profession is going. If we're wanting to try to get some statistical analysis of a feeling of those who have had it, then that's where serology tests come into play. So the first part is for the statistical analysis, I need statistical analysis so that we know how, again, is that the penetration we've had of infection so that we can create that roadmap to get back to work. We don't know how many people have had it to know. So it is a population uh, testing effort. It is for policy making. It is to determine how the next order unfolds. It is to determine at what point we can stop this lockdown that we all are under. And to eliminate confusion, to the best of my ability, I've created a list of test sites with our medical professional, uh, our epidemiologist, uh, and created a list of all the sites that testing is available. And during our elected officials call, I went over each city's uh, availability of testing with name, address, and phone number. And I asked the mayor and city manager of each to respond, and I waited, and each one confirmed what I had was good, was accurate, and was complete. 
And so I launched with my first video. And then uh, some additional clarification was asked. And so <clears throat> I've made a second video. My hope is to open testing up to more people. It consistently has been the goal. And the statistical, that's the word you use, is exactly right. I need that for policymaking. I need that for the next order. I need that for getting us back to work. And I don't want to wait until three months from now to start looking at that. I really want to know sooner than later the penetration of infection in our community, if you've had it, if you're asymptomatic, uh, because I believe that with the help of our uh, economic development people and with the help of our chamber people and others, we can uh, loosen up our um, essential businesses and start to slowly, cautiously, inch back going back to work. Because what we're doing right now is not testing enough people to make that educated decision. And um, we, can't, we can't stay the course of do nothing or do what we're doing. I have the responsibility of pushing for more testing so that we could change course from the current roadmap that we're on. I, I have a question, and maybe Mr. Kennedy can clarify this, but whenever you say you need, we need this information to clarify for whatever the next order may be to roll back and redefine what essential businesses are, which might be able to open or, or to, to reopen, am I incorrect? Uh, and I'm looking for your legal counsel here, given the last order from the governor, I mean, did that not supersede when our, that and the one from the president, what essential, it, with the definition of what essential businesses were and how those businesses in the future would be reopened? Just for my clarification, I, I think Are you referencing the, the, the last local order by the county judge? No, the, the, the question was, we need this information to for future orders, and correct me if I'm wrong, I want you to clarify, um, to help us determine what businesses we may or may be able to open, how we would redefine what essential businesses were. What I'm trying to do is open more back up. So in other right. words, we have a list of 10 exactly. essential businesses to make it 12, to make it 14, to add more uh, a scaled in approach to opening back up for business. Right, and, and that, that, was my, that was my question. Um, forgive me if I'm incorrect here, but can you clarify, did, the, did the, the governor's last order, along with the, I believe also the president's last order, um, actually define those essential businesses and supersede anything that we had at the local level? Yes and yes. Uh, we, we looked at it quite a bit. Uh, the governor's order places some restrictions on the, the ability of the local governments to uh, create a more stringent a rule as it applies to essential services. Uh, those essential services were um, about on par roughly with with the essential businesses that we had defined in the last local order. Uh, it superseded, after some review, we decided that it was best to say that the governor's order superseded the last local order. The order we are currently under is the last governor's order, which was right at the beginning of this month. Um, I, I know we referenced a, the governor's next order. I looked on the website, and it's not issued yet. So we, we do anticipate <coughs> that another governor's order will issue this week. We don't know what it will say until we read it, of course. So, so I guess my question is, it, just to build on that, um, I don't think that we can use, we would be able to use the knowledge. I mean, I'm all about additional knowledge. I, I think that additional testing is great if it's, if it's testing that's usable. Um, I guess the, the, my concern, one of the other concerns that I have is that even if we use this to truly, to your point, try to make a policy decision as to what businesses we could expand and open up or use this as a tool, we don't have that ability given the governor's last order. I think and that's, where, that's where my concern is, is because I, I don't want us to, um, again, I don't want us to miscommunicate or to mislead our public and say that we're doing this because we we believe or we this will get, action A and action B will get us to, to outcome C. If we do more testing of this type, if we have more knowledge, we'll have a better knowledge base, and so therefore we're going to be able to open up more more businesses. I believe. And, and I, 
and I will be more than happy to let you talk. I just don't think that we, we as a county have that ability given the last order from the, the governor. And I may be completely wrong, but that was my take on it as well. So what you're saying is that the governor will decide when businesses open up right. or not. Us. I believe that Mr. Kennedy said more restrictive. My goal uh, ultimately is to be theoretically, ultimately, in the time, when the time comes, I'm not saying next week, but when we get there, we may not be off from what the governor says. But my job is not to plan for today. My job is to plan for weeks from now. And so Mr. Kennedy said more restrictive. Well, I'm not trying to be more restrictive than the governor. I'm trying to create a roadmap to be less restrictive. Well, and I would agree with that. I think that what the governor did was he saw local municipalities not being restrictive enough. And that was very surprising to me and that so he, he would have stepped in and uh, taken away local control. That was very surprising to me. Nevertheless, oh. nevertheless, I, I think, think that we can agree that over the last number of years with unfunded mandates, our, our state government has done a great job of taking away local control. It's terrible. <laughs> but I, I do believe that uh, this is, just to summarize so we don't take too long on this, I believe that um, we need to open up the valve on providing more testing of any kind that we can get our hands on that is legal, provided uh, by or dispensed by medical professionals. And if it's expanding an existing budget or um, having some, I just want to have some deliberate effort from this court to say, here's some money for more testing that's approved by medical professionals to use and dispense. I think uh, Rachel with San Marcos is here. I didn't know she had something she wanted to add. Uh, but uh, well, let me, while let me, she's uh, coming up, if, if you don't. Just a second. I'd like to ask, uh, have a week to try and get um, the health department to see what we can do with our local health care providers to expand on our current uh, testing program and to see if they're willing to come to the table with some additional um, services for us. I, I, mean, I, would, I would appreciate a strategy. Perfect. That's perfect. A strategy of what type of testing, where, how, who are we supposed to be testing, why are we doing it? What are we going to do with the information? Everybody says that the serology tests will be great towards the end to do these things. Let's say we had them all right now. We tested the entire county with, with these tests. What would we do with it? Who would make the call? I mean, I'm not qualified. Is it 10% had it, 5% had it, 1% had it, 50% had it? What does it mean? And who's going to tell us what it means? And I assume we're going to be making some decisions in regionally as well. If, if you opened up the workforce, to, if, the, if the governor said nobody can have an order anymore, as of tomorrow, it's back to normal life. Let's say he did that. Whether he has the authority to, to or not, I'm sure would be argued. But let's say his order changes. You can never be more restrictive than me. And as of tomorrow, you're back to, you're back to business. We have we, some funds through DSHS that I'd like to ask the state about. Um, and what our leniency is with, with using those. So. Yeah, because we're not going to, we're not in a bubble in Hayes County. If we tested everybody in Hayes County and we found out there is really only 1% that are infected, oh, y'all just go back to your daily lives. Okay, I'm going to start driving to Austin again. Everybody that works in, on the quarter, I'm going to start doing that again. I doubt that's the advice that we'd be given for medical professionals. It's, it's, we come in too much interaction in a region, especially a corridor that has transportation uh, international transportation. So I, I'm saying that whatever the test is, I'd like to see a strategy for what its purpose is, how it will be delivered. Um, I'd like input from medical professionals, the medical professionals that are, that are we're going to be asking to do it. Um, is there, uh, there's doctors and practices that are performing these tests currently? Is that the case? Yes, for the their same, patients? There's the same test that we're performing. Right. And I have a list of them, too. We don't have to go off the top of Those your mind. Those are the only Head. tests that we would be asking for so, through our grant. And we don't have anything to do with their operation. Their Other than receiving the reporting. Right. They are independent. receiving those tests through their own channels, whatever, however they procure them and paying for them and charging their patients or their insurance to pay for that, or however this, the federal laws are working now with how those right. tests are paid for. And so there's nothing that stops... Um, the, any physician group from performing tests for their patients. Right. right, right. And there's, and I guess that's, is there, in, all of these conversations have become confused. Is, if there is a, an entity, whether it's MD Box or anybody else that does telemedicine, they can operate in Hayes County. They don't need our 
Right. I got the. They don't need our approval. I mean, they're, if they're a licensed physician and that's Some licensed. Some of them actually are located here. Who, who that's right. That. So they. Seton, others. And our health care plan, I believe, at the county offers telemedicine to employees. And so I'm assuming. They're, they're almost all offering. Based on the list I confirmed with all the mayors, almost every single one is offering telemedicine. And uh, Mayor Mitchell just sent me something last night about another place called uh, Cura Telehealth offering drive through COVID testing. And it's also, uh, they also have the, I was going to read it, but I'm not going to. We've been and that was my point. Enough. With more places coming online, what is the need for and, us And to what is their volume testing? capacity? How many tests are they, are, are they coming to us saying, we want to do more testing, but we can't procure the tests. Help us do that. Or are they coming, because again, if, if they're licensed to practice and perform those services, they can do that today in Hayes County. That doesn't require... We, we have no authority over that. We have zero authority. Exactly. To, 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 so that, there's nothing that's keeping people from testing because of any action of the court. What we're talking about are county funds. Some could be reimbursed or not. And again, I, sure. yes, we want to do it the best way we can to be reimbursed for costs to be responsible. But at the same time, we want, the we want to do what's right. And if there's so much red tape involved and we know that's what's best, if the medical profession tells us this is what you should be doing and we have the means to do it, then I think we would all be supportive and willing to take a risk that maybe we don't get 100% reimbursed. I think that's, if that's what's the best thing to do, then that's what we should do. That's good. And the but I need to know that. I haven't heard from any medical professional about how to test, when to test, who to test, except for the guidelines that we can continue to reiterate. And until then, I don't know, you know, we've seen letters from our medical directors of some of the EMS operators within the county that say, Serology tests have a place in this, but for diagnosis and for where we are, these other tests are what we should be using. So if that's the case, then where do we test people and who do we test? And how many of them do we expect to happen? I understand your point, Judge. You can't, you have no, you can't open it up without any tests. So I'm, what I'm looking for is guidance from our public health department, making sure that the state, the feds, whoever else agrees that it's the right strategy. If they're saying more testing and we say, hey, what do you think about this? We're gonna open up three testing sites. You know, and our goal is to diagnose uh, potential patients. We would need to partner with local right. facilities. Somebody would do that, that or we would have to ramp up ourselves. some sort of medical staff, which we don't have. Right. Uh, so we would be looking to partner with some groups like the, maybe the one we are partnering with or other ones like them to open up, but there should be a strategy or a plan for what we're going to do, how much funding we think it's going to take, uh, where they're going to set up the testing facilities, what's the purpose of it, is it for diagnostics, is it for serology so that we can have data, and then what do we do with the data when we have it? Are we going to bring forward how many people have had, and again, these tests can be false positive, they can test. All of them can, right. just to be clear. But the serology, again, is it, it, if you had the cold last year, it could come up and say that you're, you're fine, that you've had it and now you're clean, which that's not the case. So we want to be careful when we use something like that to tell somebody you're safe. There is, may, there may be not safe. And if we go just get a molecular test today, I go get one today, and it says, oh, you're, you don't have COVID. Well, great. What about tomorrow? Yeah, that's right. We're, you know, that's right. go get gas and, and touch no the gas one, pump. Well, did I just no, get COVID then? That's right. And uh, no I, one test is intended to be independent or to replace another. And that's exactly what has been but, conveyed. But that's well. where I want to make sure we understand what we're telling people <laughs> because if we're gonna, it, right now, we're all supposed to, for the most part, just assume everybody has it. Don't keep your distance from everyone, you know, and be careful. I mean, that's so, what does that change? If I go get a negative test, it, it shouldn't change my life at all. I should. You know, I'm, not, I'm still not going to go give my, my mother a hug right now, even if I took a test today that said I'm, I'm negative because I could get it getting gas on the way to her house. And so I just want to make sure we have that strategy of what it is we're trying to test, what it is that we're trying to get, who we're, tr we're trying to test, and what the reasons are. And if serology is, this, is an option for statistics, what are we going to do with it? Who's going to take it? Who's going to analyze it? Who's going to tell us what it means? Because I can guarantee you I'm not going to be able to tell what it means. What's safe? What's not safe? Half your population has had it. Seventy-five percent of your population has had it. I mean, I think those are the type of Sorry. questions that I would want answered. Tammy, you were going to add something? Uh, no, I was just going to say I'd, I'll get with the local professionals or health care professionals in the next week and see. I think. Thank you, ma'am. I think this is a, a supply and demand comment and item, 
And uh, just to reiterate, we do have a list of medical professionals that I have uh, confirmed and validated with our mayors and city managers countywide. We do have spaces where testing is available. I have been promoting it, and um, I think our current standards for testing are too stringent, and I think we need to test more people. And this agenda item is to provide more testing to our county, to our area, to put into this system that's already in place, to provide it for these professionals so that they will have more um, comfort knowing that they can pull another <coughs> test off the shelf and it's not one of two or one of three. Now we have a dozen tests. Okay, we'll test more freely because each medical professional on this list has their own criteria that they go by. And so my hope is that once we provide more testing to the market, to the county, on our footprint, that we will help them to relax the standards and test more people for whatever it is, for flu or for strep or for, for whatever's going on. But right now we're, I feel bad saying it this way, but right now I feel like we're hoarding tests for the, for the ultimate scenario. Well, I just think we can benefit from testing more people with our current system, with our current medical professionals, just by simply bringing more tests to the market. Judge, I would agree with you. I do have one question, though. And, Tammy, in your conversation with those medical professionals, this is something that I want to, that I think is very, very important and a very important question to ask. Um, to your point, expanding the program that we have right now to get additional information, I can, I can be fully supportive of that, to expand additional testing there. But I want to hear in your conversation with those medical professionals what tests they feel comfortable using. Because at the end of the day, if we buy a test and we make a decision to purchase a specific type, a specific company, a specific, to your point, each one of them has their own standard that they use. I don't want us to buy a bunch of tests and then we have to go out and our, med our own medical professionals aren't, aren't willing or aren't... Uh, comfortable with either administering those tests or the outcomes that those tests will provide. And those are the two things that we have to keep a very straight and level head regarding when we talk about this testing. And, and I would just ask in your conversation, have a very direct conversation and a very direct question with them. What tests do you, and, and I'm not talking about just name brand, I'm talking about what type of test what suppliers have you used in the past? Who do you have a familiarity with? Who are you, who have you in the past, you know, not, not the last two months, but in the last two days, who have you been able to get tests from? Because we know that it changes that quickly. Um, but at the end of the day, if we buy tests, we have to ensure that we have some medical professional out there who's actually willing to put their name on it and administer that test. And so I just wanna make sure that whenever you have that conversation, please, make that point to them and ask what they would be willing to do. My understanding from, um, and I suppose Eric can speak to this, is everyone that's, or most medical professionals that are testing in Hayes County are using the same lab that we are using um, on our testing. So we're all on the same page as to what tests um, are being administered. That's interesting information. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Tammy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we, you believe that uh, in a week's time you can get the information that's needed so that we can move forward with? I think we can, yes. Some kind of action. Okay. And I, I know one of the medical professionals that you'll be reaching out to is our medical authority, Dr. Anderson. I think it's important that he be involved, and I know that he will be. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. So yeah. will you please open agenda what? item number 17? Yeah, just, just, I think Rachel may have had something she wanted to add from San Marcos. She, I know she was here. The commissioners, Rachel Engel, City of San Marcos Emergency Management Coordinator. Some of the information <clears throat> just that I want to reiterate is that the molecular testing, the swabs, are for the diagnostic test. That's to diagnose the COVID-19 disease and that the um, serology testing is not meant for diagnosis, which um, Commissioner Shell has also identified. It's confirmatory testing. 
And so with that being said, you know, the, the one test, the serology test that has been given an emergency use authorization is for that purpose. It's not for diagnosis. And so when we take that information, we're looking at, when we talk about future planning, and the CDC has identified this too of several documents that I've read of theirs over the last several days, in that we're looking at the second wave of what this looks like. And this is in the fall and winter. And the reason it's in the fall and winter is because that's when we're gonna start lifting all of these uh, restrictions. Kids go back to school, people go back to work and all of that, and this is gonna contribute to the second wave that we'll see. And so in looking at that, what do our supplies of PPE look like? What do our testing supplies look like? So the purpose of using the molecular test is to get that picture of what community spread looks like. And I believe we have a really good idea right now of what that is and that we know we have community spread going on. And Mr. Schneider has indicated this every day that we've had on our operational briefings in the mornings for all of the EOC operational staff out in the field, all of our first responders. And we ask questions like, what are the challenges that you're seeing within your jurisdiction, within your profession? What are the challenges today? What do you need to help you do your job better? And not one of them has said we need more tests. What they say is we need more PPE. So in our planning efforts, we're looking at how can we create suitable substitutes for not being able to get gowns. Okay, so we're gonna go out and we're gonna look for lab coats because lab coats provide the same level of protection for our first responders out in the field, so let's do that. And so we're trying to get creative and think outside the box of what our response looks like and what our recovery looks like. And if we're using a benchmark of, is this test reimbursable to decide if we're gonna purchase something or not, then you're purchasing it for the wrong reason. Make our purchases for, to move us forward in our response and recovery efforts, not just to see if the federal government's gonna pass back. And so in my planning efforts for the city of San Marcos and with the planning efforts with all of the first responders across the county, that's what I'm looking at is, what do we need to be able to respond to, for our responders to go out into the field and to save people's lives and do their jobs? What do they need in order to do that to move us forward throughout this pandemic? It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's not gonna be over in a month. And so with that being said, we wanna look at that future planning and the testing is gonna give us the more um, in-depth look at where we might have clusters throughout our communities and throughout the different municipalities. But we already know we have clear evidence of community spread and we've done over 600 tests and over 500 have come back negative. And so we wanna be careful of our resources and that we're not taxing all of our laboratories that are conducting the testing for us, that we don't overwhelm them and that we don't suck up all the tests for testing somebody that doesn't need to be tested. And so we're meeting the need. For somebody who needs a test, they get tested. So they, the CDC has outlined that criteria of what that is. And Hayes County has been very good about sticking to that criteria and making sure those folks get tested. <coughs> so that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate it. But Judge, I do have to follow up because I am the one that asked the question if uh, these tests were uh, going to be reimbursable and in no way, and I'm not saying that anybody is saying it, but in no way did I mean for that to uh, say that I wasn't supportive of purchasing any test that was not reimbursable. I agree, I mean, safety is number one of our residents and we need to do everything that we can to ensure that we're doing what we can uh, to ensure their safety. And so I just wanted to make that clear. And, and Rachel, the other thing is that, so if I'm understanding you correctly, the uh, $500,000 that uh, the city approved uh, was none of, none of that was for uh, testing. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? So what they've done is given the city manager the authority to make expenditures up to $500,000 without city council approval. And so those can be for personal protective equipment, any disinfectant supplies, um, or test kits if the city so chooses to do so. At this time, my recommendation has been that the city not get in the testing business. 
Um, we, you know, that, that's just not a good plan in the fact that we have medical professionals that are qualified and trained at clinics and standalone ERs to conduct these tests for us and that we should leave that to them. Okay, I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. And, and Judge, while Rachel's up, I just want to thank her publicly. I'll, uh, my first responders in my uh, precinct can't say enough good things about how helpful you've been. I know you've been a good resource for Alex and the county. We appreciate you being a, such a good team player with uh, all across Hayes County. Thank you. thank you. Yes, it's been a wonderful team effort, and it's true. I've sat there in the EOC with you all day sometimes, and it's a, it's a nice uh, collaboration that's been taking place. But based on what the state is wanting us to do and how it's starting to break out and expand further, it's, um, as I said in yesterday's uh, elected officials call, it's not a, a negative in any way or to be taken as a negative in any way. I'm <coughs> genuinely grateful for all of the city of St. Michael's' effort but it's time to uh, expand it just a little bit further now, and that's what the whole effort was about. And I want to thank you, and I agree with you also about uh, we should not get into the testing business. I've not said that as well for a point of clarification like Commissioner Inglesby has just made. I'm not into the, don't want to get into the testing business either. I just want to bring, as I've continued to say, I want to bring the resources to the professionals and let them do with it how they uh, see best. So thank you again for all you've done. Do we have another comment over here? I just want to say thank you again. I mean, I, I, the folks in the northern part of the county have, a lot of them didn't know you before this, and uh, they cannot say uh, enough positive things about uh, the effort and the, the information that you've shared with them. And um, I, that doesn't come lightly. You know how hard it is at times for fire chiefs and other folks <laughs> to give compliments. And so I, I don't say that in a joking manner, but um, they, uh, they really do appreciate you, and uh, for those reasons, I, I appreciate what you've done as well. Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. wish the county best of luck in its individual emergency operations center. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go on to uh, agenda item 17, was there something in 18 that we wanted to address? Uh, because I had it set up uh, holistically, and I wanted to know if Chief Reyes wanted to add anything to, or Alex Villalobos wanted to add anything to that agenda item conversation before we move on from it. Commissioners, Judge Raul Reyes, Director of Emergency Services. I too want <clears throat> to congratulate the joint ELC that was created between the city and the county. I'm coming in here with a different perspective because I look at uh, bringing my experience and my uh, accomplishments to a county that I see as uh, operating a little differently but still very effective, and that's what I saw. Um, when we're looking at the county and the fire chiefs and the EMS uh, people, uh, I again want to stress what the commissioners have already said, is that they may not be looking at it so much from uh, an emergency management point of view or from a medical point of view. They're looking at it from what they need for their particular department or their particular region. And so I want to stress that what I see it, uh, going on in, in uh, Hayes County is that without numbers, we can't really do, <coughs> excuse me, uh, future planning. Is that I look at a statistical analysis as a tool so that I can pre-plan. Specifically saying, when I got here a little over two weeks ago, we were reacting to what was happening in Bear County and in Travis County because they had the numbers, they had colleges, and they had people devoted to putting statistics out. And so when I got here, we had, as an example, nine confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases positive. A little over two weeks, we're getting close to 100. And so st statistically for me, that, that puts parameters or thresholds that says that we have to do pre-planning or future planning a little bit more aggressively. And so I've been in collaboration with the emergency management coordinator and the director for uh, Hayes County, and we have come with an idea that we need to expand it, we need to be a little bit more aggressive, um, and I fully support the idea that the coordinator and the director want to take it in a different direction my position is more of an oversight to give direction, to give uh, counsel, 
and to provide resources where I can as far as the county is concerned. And so, I, again, I want to appreciate the, the, uh, the joint efforts between the city of uh, San Marcos and Hayes County. Um, but at this particular point, it looks like we're going to be uh, moving a little different, but it's still the same resources are available to, to San Marcos whenever they need it. Uh, however, we're looking more in the direction of pre-planning for, uh, if we we're at 100 now, uh, without more, more levels of, of statistics, we can't really get to a point where we can say we're like New Orleans, California, and New York where we have peaked and now we see less cases being uh, reported. Um, I don't know where that's going to be because with less than 1% tested, I can't gauge where that peak may be. And that's very good information for the commissioners. If we can determine based on the number of tests or the number of confirmed and those that have recovered or where we peak, then you can make financial decisions based on uh, what's in the best interest of the county. And so with that, uh, that's, that's my spiel. Do you have any questions for me? I know commissioners. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for <coughs> speaking up. Mr. Villalobos, last call. Is this the point where we talk about the purchasing, the new policy that we were talking about, or is this another agenda item? I, I don't know. I mean, we discussed I, last night. I told you I would love to talk. You, you bring it up whenever and we could talk about it. I'd be, I was supportive of what we talked about. So. Okay. Uh, I know there's brought to my attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, I spoke with you yesterday, and I, and I asked you, you know, what, what you thought of the process and, and how it was supposed to facilitate purchasing. And uh, you gave me your feedback, and, and, and I, I understood pretty much the same way. Um, when we're looking at, we're giving a, a maximum of $5,000 to, to purchase. I know that we're still being required to provide uh, quotes, uh, three quotes before, uh, before we purchase. And I, in your understanding and my understanding is that this would be done to facilitate the policy to be done, it could be done retrospect or thought <coughs> process retrospect. And the reason for that. Could I, could I have one other thing that we didn't talk about last yes, night? Sir. That the other thing is, I think our current policy says you have to attempt to get three quotes. And so I would even say, and this might throw the conversation in a different direction, but if we, if you reach out, I, and this was my understanding, if you attempted to get multiple quotes during that period, but then were unable to get the quotes, as long as you can show that you did, that you attempted that, that would help qualify as well. Maybe that helps your conversation or your, your point, actually. But and I don't know. And, and I think there was a there's a specific situation with regards to some uh, w one of our other persons that are, uh, have those resources available to them, and making a purchase in time because this is when they have the availability right now is to get it within an hour or two, and then to get that, and then to get the quotes that show that uh, whether the time lapse or whatnot, because of, as you and I discussed, how organic the pricing is, is that it, it looks bad upon the person making the purchase because that price might be a little bit higher at that point and the other ones come in low quotes when you're, submit, when you're submitting those. So we're just very sensitive on that, on that piece uh, and that's what has been uh, brought to my attention with regards to that. And I just wanna make sure that we are doing this appropriately and that we can function in a fluid way rather than having to stop, wait, and let's make sure that we're, we're, we're doing all this before we even are able to get the resources that we need immediately. And that's what, I'm, that's what I would like to help facilitate. But I hope we also said and stressed that this process would be expedited. And I think the auditor's office said that they could do it. And so if you're having issues, then we need to know. Uh, oh, yes, uh, I think what in getting the quotes and from the understanding from us and from I think some of the staff members when they're making the purchases is that okay we can't we can't agree and we can't commit resources to get those resources right we have to wait to get the quotes and sometimes that time lapse creates an issue on getting what's available um, and that's that's where the that's where the issue comes into play not necessarily that they're not Could I I mean, clarify? They're, they're, they're pushing through it they're pushing yeah. through it as best as they can absolutely and we understand that, and that we uh, actually was helping Alex with the purchase over the weekend. Um, I was, we have not asked them to provide quotes 
for PPE supplies, we've asked them to pro provide one quote, the quote that they had the vendor readily available that could provide those supplies. We still have to do a debarment check. That's a requirement of the TEDM and FEMA. So that is that has to be performed. And we've offered to then go and look for the additional quotes to satisfy the procurement. I was able to do that in 15 minutes. He provided me one quote that he wanted to, to purchase hand sanitizer from. I was able to go online in less than 15 minutes, get two other quotes that were higher. One was lower. I, I actually pulled three quotes. And the one that was lower was because it wasn't available to ship until August. So it was reasonable. And I, <coughs> I sent those quotes on to our purchasing department. We set up the vendor. We actually had the credit card information available for pickup yesterday. So we're not asking for three quotes if, if that's putting any additional work on that group. We're asking for an official quote from the vendor ahead of time before you're making the purchase so that we can do the debarment check and that we can provide the assistance to go try to gather the additional quotes. So is that 15 minute timeline, uh, Alex, working with, or, or that, are we talking works, about something totally different? That works different great for, for myself, but I think a scenario with regards to Mike Jones came up with, with regards to his particular issue is that at that point in time, he identified a purchase and he needed to make that purchase at the time because it was a timing issue. For mine, I had plenty of time to utilize them in their services. I was happy, hey, can you do this? <clears throat> but when they're in the field and they're making those purchases and they need them right away, I think that's, I was trying to either number one, get clarification or, do we raise the bar within the minimum purchase of 500? And I think that was an issue that's that he brought awesome. up as himself to allow this to be a little bit more fluid when they're in the field making these purchases they need in a very timely manner. And I thought that's what we did when we discussed the COVID policy last week was went back and took a hard look at what those PPE supplies are, what they felt they would need immediately out in the field, what our office could assist with, not to hold the process up, but to still perform the proper Required, procurement yeah. documentation that we have to have to meet the policy that the court passed. So Mike, I mean, was there an issue? And So if you're purchasing out in the field and you, not everybody has a county issue credit card. So that is, would be the first issue. And not all, not all vendors will accept a purchase order so those are things that you would have to come to the auditor's office to get resolution for. And that's the things that we could help with. We provided our personal cell phones, Muddy Soul and I both. We're available after hours on the weekends at any time to yes, assist with purchases. Yes, they are. I've tested it. <laughs> sure, I, I think you guys have <coughs> beat this horse. Pretty well right now. Mike Jones, Ace Kenny. I think, I think we might be good, but Commissioner Inglesby asked you to come to the podium. Did you have a question for him? Well, yes. I mean, was there an issue with one of the purchases so that you had? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I say an issue. We, we, we got past it the, uh, because what we had to do is submit that a price was not available thanks to Amazon. So we went we through that process. So that's a scenario that occurred prior to y'all making that decision as a court as far as what we're going to do with this follow on. What we've been running into with the uh, personal protective equipment uh, purchasing out there is that some companies have a good price on an item, and then they have that nice little caveated statement at the very bottom, prices are subject to change at any time. At any time, it would be during one of our purchases. And <laughs> it's kind of annoying, quite frankly, and I'm, I'm really kind of upset. Welcome to the we free discuss American that later on. economy. <laughs> you know, when, I'm, when we're paying $6 for a 68 cents mask, that kind of bothers me a lot. And I've, I've always thought my, myself to be a good steward of the county's monies, even though we're getting it from the federals to, to, for, for this grant that I have. But we're still, the stuff I left, I'm a pretty good steward as far as how we spend our monies. I always look for the best price and make sure we don't sacrifice quality for the price because at the same time we're talking about getting uh, masks out here to our first responders. You look at KN95s, for example, some are NIOSH approved and some and others are not. So I'm not going to buy the ones that have no NIOSH approval. And if I do, then I want to make sure the first responders understand this is not the KN95 that you're looking for. This is what, but it's a mask, and so deal with it. 
because we're in, we're in those expedient times where we're just going to have to improvise, adapt, and overcome the situation. That said, every now and then we run across an instance, like for example, Granger says, hey, I've got these, I have these on, on order, I can, make, I can pull the trigger now, but you've got to do it. And then it takes time to sit there and go through, and I know Becky knows how, how tough this is, to get some additional quotes. So if you all are okay with us purchasing something because it's available, and then we get those additional quotes that says, hey, we could have got this for cheaper, and we're gonna money quarterback this later on, go ahead and thrash me now, because I'm telling you, <laughs> if we can get it, we're gonna pull the trigger and go with the policy you guys set forward, but know that I'm not doing that on purpose. Well, those were for the yeah. purchases that were between 500 and 5,000. So anything over the 5,000, that was my understanding, the court wanted those purchases, whether they were PPE supplies or not, if they're 5,000 or above, the expenditure approval form would, uh, would need to be routed, which required the additional signatures. So it, that was the policy that was adopted last week to help streamline some of these purchases. You're gonna see other agenda items coming forward for purchases that were made prior um, for multiple things so that that did not have a purchase order or did not meet that procurement guideline or policy so again we're here to assist we know that we may be paying higher prices because we need it now we haven't um, we haven't insisted on departments to obtain those additional quotes just to give us the quote of the vendor that they're wanting to utilize so that we could do that like work. And we're happy to help streamline that process or look at amending the process if the court wants to look at that as well. Mike, while you're at the podium, I wanna ask you a question. Uh, one of the invoices was brought up a little while ago about um, our, just to spare names, uh, our drive-through uh, testing facility and I saw a couple of invoices flushed by my, passed by my desk. How was that process? Can you describe its utility on that front? Did you have to go get three bids? Were you able to say you? So when, when that occurred, uh, if you recall, when we all got together in the very early stages of this, we were looking for a testing facility that, that could fulfill our purposes for the, uh, we were talking about the premier yard site. And they were a partner of ours. We've been in collaboration before in the past about other things. When I say other things, we've, we've met each other at diff different expos and talked about uh, our close point of dispensing operation plan that we put out there. So if we had anthrax released, then you know, how, how, how we can use their resources to assist us in, in manning some of these uh, uh, drive-throughs, if you will. So ER Premier, because of their location, and when I, when I shared this with Alex, yes. yeah. When, the, uh, because of their location right there on 35, it made it for an easy, easy in, easy out. Uh, we have medical professionals on staff that can actually fulfill that need. And so when we first set it up, you're going to see that first bill, Judge, $6,000. I, I got him. I saw him. Okay. But so, I'm not being critical of it. I'm just wondering how, because I was there, I was just wondering how that process, describing it to other purchases, I'm describing, I'm wondering how you can describe the flow of that? Did you have to go through a bunch of hoops? So or? that's where I got my hand slapped by the auditors. Oh, okay. Those will be, that will be one of the items that is coming to okay. court for approval. Yeah. Okay. And, and, okay. So the cross outside, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Across the bear. No problem. Uh, so, so yeah, what, so I, I didn't follow the, the, the proper protocols in, in that respect just because we're looking at the emergency and, 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 and dispensing. Okay. Had we did this all over again, and then there's, you know, I can assure you, Vicki and I would have had a discussion, and I would have called out several other folks out there who might be willing to actually entertain the thought of helping the county. But uh, once again, the location, it's kind of like real estate, was prime right there where it was, and it gave us a nice secluded area, but also quick access and easy access based on the location and what I would call the center point. I would not complain about anything you've done as far as picking the site. I'm not complaining about it at all. I was just asking about the overall process. No, no, I was, I was, I was, was. just explaining that for everybody else to judge. Yes, yes, sir. But, can we get back to the, the point that Mr. Villalobos made? Are we in agreement on what has to be done? Well, can Are I we just, can I also yeah. add that for the emergency, that the pandemic, the, the TDM has lifted and FEMA has lifted the, the requirement to obtain quotes if the cost is deemed reasonable. So the, and, and that is a, that's a FEMA rule. 
That doesn't mean that's what we have to follow. Local governments, will they will look at the most stringent policy and you have to follow that policy. This was brought to the court to identify how they wanted to make these purchases and what format and what format that y'all were comfortable with on what levels. So that's no. why we can pay more for some items because of availability um, if it's deemed a need now. So but, but Chelsea Department's been doing this long enough. You're going to know if it's way out of line or not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you got to handle did, all of They're all vigilant. Yeah. They're all doing a good yeah. job. So, we, I mean, actually, we know there's going to be some markup, but as long as it's not We gave the, the list that y'all approved last week to yes. our purchasing manager okay. and had her reach out to four or five of our vendors that, that might have any of these supplies. And I forward all of that information to Alex and Raul to review okay. as an option for other PPE supplies. So we sent all of that last week to them for their review. Yes, my, my question would be, it, I mean, we've had this for a week. This is one of th how many of these have we had to deal with this week? Five or less? I mean, how, how many purchases this week have, have come up where there's been an issue between on the on this? Is this one? Is one. this 10? Is what, this 50? Uh, uh, is it one? Yeah, I, 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 think, so, I think the difference is, uh, Commissioner, is that my, my purchasing goes through them because I don't have the access to those right. out in the field, and that's fine because I, I love this. It's better for me, um, but I think it's in the field purchasing that comes in, and I don't know how many have come in for that, but there's been opportunities for purchasing, and I think, I don't want to inhibit our staff to make a decision on Absolutely purchasing, so, it, so it's kind of like, okay, do I have to go do all these other things before I get this, and is that, is that going to inhibit me from taking advantage of this right now that I need in the field? And Absolutely I think our, 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 our explanation, our understanding, and I, and I, and I, and I think Tammy will, will uh, speak speak and expand a little bit more on this is that the list of items that we, we, we put down are items that no question these are the things that we need these are directly in response to COVID-19 on behalf of the county if they fall on that list we're going to purchase them if we can have the opportunity to get them because there are some other places that you can say that to and by the time you go through the process in 30 minutes I no longer have them somebody already purchased I'm sorry so it's just a matter of having that kind of fluidity on making the purchases enough is that and if those purchases are less than five thousand dollars you can contact either my office phone or muddy souls or our cell phones and that county-wide credit card can be used at that moment that Best does me. not have to stop anything out in the field we are available and we're here to help with those purchases we are the not here next. to stop the process yes. I, I think on the outside on auditor's office we didn't quite understand that. We thought, oh, we can just go through this list and you know, we're still not having to deal with the quotes and they're not having to deal with getting the quotes. So maybe if we tweak that language that we still have to do that, maybe that'll clarify the confusion. I it is important to have that debarment check done. I, I get that. And so and that, just, the way you can do that is by getting that quote and sending it to our office and that can, that can be done, or at, least, or at least giving us the vendor name. And that can be done quickly. It's really a matter of seconds on the website to get that. The sooner they get it to you, the yeah. better. I think yes, it can be on the phone. Let, let, me, yes. let me try to run this just a little bit more efficiently. Ms. Crumley? I think if we just clarify the language so that those of us that are in the office doing it we're doing it right for you guys so that there's no confusion um because i think we it's not doing it right for us it's doing it by the policy that the okay. court set and that was what the court determined that would be that we would follow last week so that was what was brought for discussion and that's right on those were the parameters Very good. so just to double check and and and, and wrap this piece up could you clarify or did you get what you needed through all I these think pieces. we understand that now. Yes. Are you guys good? Yes. Okay, because whatever we got to do to give you guys all the support you need, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much. Um, okay, will you please open agenda item number 17? Number 17, <clears throat> discussion and possible action to authorize the execution of a grant contract with the Department of State Health Services in the amount of $150,839 for activities in relation to the coronavirus 2019 response and amend the budget accordingly. So moved. 
Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any additional comments? Or is it, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's well written. Please call the roll. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. And Judge Basata? Yes. To finish the section, we'll go to open 19, please. 19. Discussion on possible action to authorize the county judge to execute a contract with Briso Construction LLC for all projects under RFP 2020-P05 builder services related to the CDBG-DR housing program and approve the notice to proceed for execution at each pre-construction meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any comments? Yes. Maybe do you have any comments for this one? I do. Uh, Mr. Mark Kennedy Mark. does. Uh, we uh, were a little short on time last week when this item came to us, and we uh, had some minor edits to their to the <coughs> contract that you're finding back up. The uh, I'll just I'll just the, you'll note that it's watermarked draft and back up, and the reason that is that we wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to look at this more thoroughly um, late in the week and over the weekend. Um, we have uh, probably a few changes that we'll make. I'll just note them verbally. Uh, they're still a little flexible. I think they need to be probably negotiated with companies. So I just wanted to note them for you. Sorry, Mr. Kennedy. Sorry. Um, the uh, liquidated damages on page six, we, we uh, probably need to adjust the date on that on page six of the contract. Uh, it's dated for end of July. And I think with, with the COVID-19 situation, we probably want to move that back, but I wanted to discuss that with our consultants and with the company. Uh, on page 12, we'd like to lengthen the timeline for termination for cause. Currently, it's a 10 calendar day termination for cause, so we're going to lengthen that. On page 16, we would like to make that indemnity clause conspicuous. It's currently not conspicuous, and Texas law requires that it be conspicuous for it to be enforceable. And then lastly, um, uh, just to piggyback on the conversation we just had, since uh, this will involve a CDBG grant, we need to make sure that this is in full compliance with 2 CFR 200, the uh, federal regulations for procurement, et cetera. And uh, we do have a lot of language in this contract. You'll note, uh, you'll, you'll note that, <coughs> for instance, Davis-Bacon Act is cited in there. There are other acts that are cited in there that, that uh, require uh, compliance by the contractor. And I just want to make sure we review it one more time just to ensure that two CFR 200 clauses are all in there. I believe they are, but I want to look through that one more time before we execute. And those will be, I think, the general changes we'll make. There are a couple of other cleanups, but they're not substantive. So if the court would allow that, I'll make sure that the clerk has the final copy in backup going forward. Thank you for your diligence. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. We have a motion and a second. Are there any other comments? Please call the roll. Commissioner Shell. Yes. Commissioner Downs. Yes. Commissioner Inglesby. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. And Judge Becerra. Yes. Will you, um, our fire marshal has communicated to my office, as he does every week, that we do not need a burn ban. And uh, I'll get this side out of the way. If you will please open uh, agenda item number 21. 21, discussion related to the Hayes County population to include current population counts and costs. So uh, our sheriff gives my office a report every week and this is the week's report of jail capacity for the week of April 5th through April 11th, 2020. The current capacity is still 362 inmates. Jail standards recommends holding approximately 10% of capacity open. That lowers our capacity to 311. Jail's daily average was 388 and peak was 394 on April 8th for the week of April 5th through April 11th, 2020. The estimated cost for outsourcing inmates this week is $57,000 Five hundred thirty-four dollars. 
the average number of outsourced males is 142, and females are zero. I'm just so excited to see that number. That's just money saved in my heart. So very nice. I really appreciate this effort, and I know that it's uh, multifaceted, and it's very complex, and there's no one silver bullet reason for any of this or office, but I'm just genu genuinely thankful as a whole. Um, and this week's inmates were housed in the following counties, Burnett, Caldwell, Fort Bend, Guadalupe, Travis, and Walker. Will you please open item number three through eight? Three, approve payments to county invoices. Four, approve the payment of United Healthcare claims. Five, approve commissioner's court minutes of April 7, 2020. Six, approve the payment of the April 15, 2020 payroll disbursements in an amount not to exceed $2,905,000 effective April 15, 2020 and post toll for wages, withholding, deductions and benefits in the Hayes County site once finalized. Seven, authorize building maintenance to replace a failed air handler unit valued at $3,765 for the Sheriff's Precinct 3 Satellite Office and amend the budget accordingly. Eight, authorize the county judge to execute amendment number one to the HHS contract number HHS 00037150030, granting a no cost extension with a revised training date of June 30th, 2021. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments? Please call the roll. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Inglesby? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Deputy Sabbath? Yes. Please open 9 through 14. 9. Authorize the county judge to execute an annual agreement between Hayes County and Star Asset Security out of $17,109 for the annual inspections and Name all Hayes County fire systems, extinguishers, and alarms. Ten, ratify the acceptance of 80 Whataburger gift cards from Mr. William Howard, valued at $8, and amend the budget accordingly. Eleven, ratify the donation of hand sanitizer from the Fraternal Order of Police, valued at $85, for the Sheriff's Office Patrol Unit. And the budget accordingly. Twelve, approve payment of invoices to Rip Insurance Agency for annual tax assessor collector bond, where no purchase order was requested per Hayes County purchasing policy. Thirteen, authorize the county judge to execute a proposal with Concern Technologies Inc. related to an audiovisual system for the new jail addition and training building and amend the budget accordingly. 14, ratify the designation of bleach from Formosa Plastic Corporation, Texas Countywide Sanitation, related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and amend the budget accordingly. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments? Judge, I uh, <clears throat> just want to say thank you to Mr. Howard and Whataburger for their donation and also to uh, for Mosa Plastics uh, for their donation. I, and I want to reiterate as well, thank you to um, to Deep Eddy Distilling um, they, their, for their donation of hand sanitizer to the Fraternal Order of Police and to the Fraternal Order of Police for actually donating it to the county. So um, it's greatly appreciated. And uh, we'll have another item that, uh, that we were able to accept this week as far as hand sanitizer, and that item will be on next week's agenda. Uh, but we, our, our distilleries here in Hayes County have stepped up significantly to help us. Uh, we're blessed uh, to have a lot of good distilleries in our county that other counties wish they had because they're producing hand sanitizer now. 
And so um, we're very thankful for it. Ms. Crumley? Um, item number 14, there's a, um, just a small correction that needs to be made. We received just under 300 gallons and with the value of about $1,200. And I will get the auditor the breakdown of that valuation as soon as we receive it. And I'd like to thank Formosa Plastics for that donation as well. Thank you, Ms. Crumley, for clarifying. We have a motion and a second. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Shell. Yes. Commissioner Jim. Who? Who? <laughs> yes. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Ingalls. I was going to vote yes anyway. I think we're all good. <laughs> yes. Um, Commissioner Smith. Yes. And Judge Bethesda. Yes. And I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Will you please open up 15 and 16? 15A, authorized payment automation design for $1,461.50 for the Justice of the Peace Precinct 5 office related to courtroom security camera repairs in which no purchase order was issued as required per county purchasing policy the budget accordingly. Pain. Authorized payment to post consult for $5,599.50 for COVID-19 PPE supplies in which no purchase was issued as required per county prudent policy. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We've already discussed these items. These came before uh, we established some policy. And um, I think we've elaborated and expanded and articulated. Please call the roll. Commissioner Ingalls? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Judge Vista Yes. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs>